final item on the agenda, which is item 10.2, plan development and rezoning permit, uh, El Paso de Saratoga, uh, at Saratoga and Launch Expressway in Quito. Um, well, let's go to roll call first, honey. Jimenez. Morales? Here. Cohen? Here. Roscoe? Here. Davis? Here. Esparza? Arenas? Here. Foley? <coughs> Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo? Present. You have a quorum. All right, thank you. Okay, we have a presentation. It looks like, uh, Robert, are you leading us off? Great, welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Robert Manford, Deputy Director for Planning. With me today, uh, to thank Assistant uh, Director for PBC, David Keon, Principal Planner for Environmental Review Unit, and Jay Guevara, Deputy Director for Public Works. The item before you today is the El Paso and Saratoga Signature Project. As can be seen on the map, the project site is located on two sides of Saratoga Avenue. Uh, we have the 1312 El Paso de Saratoga. The Saratoga site is located east of the intersection of The 1312 El Paso de Saratoga site is located east of the intersection of Saratoga Avenue and Lawrence Expressway, which is the biggest site that you see. The 1777 Saratoga Avenue is located on the north of the intersection of Saratoga Avenue and Lawrence, which is the smaller site that you see on top. With regards to the project description, it entails the rezoning from CG and CP to CP Plan Development Zoning District, and also the demolition of approximately 126,000 square feet of existing commercial space and removal of 120 trees. Construction of four mixed-use buildings, including 994 residential units with approximately 150 affordable housing units, 165,000 square feet of commercial space, 3.5 acres of publicly accessible open space, including 1.1 acre public park. A conditional use permit and public determination of public convenience of necessity for off-sale alcohol at a future grocery store and construction outside the normal hours of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The project is found to be in conformance with all development regulations and uh, land use standards for the city. It was reviewed for conformance with the general plan, the municipal zoning code, residential design guidelines, uh, city council policy 630, which is public outreach and CEQA. The project was also submitted in December 2019, therefore it's subject to the original signature project criteria. Per signature project criteria, 164 square feet of commercial development is required. The project produces 165 square feet of commercial development. A minimum of 55 dwelling units per acre residential density is required. The project produces 92 dwelling units per acre. Plan development zoning allows for the development of the project at the density, height, configuration, and with the incorporation of open space as required for a signature project. With regards to environmental review, an EIR was prepared for the project and it was calculated for 45 days, beginning October 15, 2021 to November 29. Two project options were analyzed, education makes this option and non-education makes this option. No significant and unavoidable impacts 
were identified under each of those scenarios. We received over 70 comments. All of those comments have been fully responded to and the responses to comments have been posted to the city's website uh, since May 6, 2022. It included an errata on May 13th and based on all the information received, no recirculation of the EIR is necessary. Staff is recommending, requesting uh, three actions from the city council, which are the adopt, to adopt a resolution certified in the environmental impact report, approve an ordinance rezoning the property, and adopt a resolution approving a planned development permit to allow the demolition of the of approximately 126 square feet of existing commercial buildings, removal of 120 trees for construction of four mixed use buildings consisting of 994 residential units, 165,000 square feet of commercial space, and increase in the construction hours for 15 hours to pour concrete between 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. and also a conditional use permit and determination of public convenience and necessity to allow all sale of alcohol at a future grocery store on the 10.76 acre grocery site. Uh, it should be noted that the uh, Planning Commission also recommended a friendly amendment to consider addition of the Saratoga Avenue corridor into the West San Jose Multimodal Transportation Improvement Plan. We coordinated with the Department of Transportation and they've already done that. This concludes the application. Thank you, Robert. Okay, uh, I think the way it usually goes is we have uh, five minutes for the applicant. And the applicant is present and uh, staff from planning and other departments are also here. Okay. Great, thank you. Are we ready? Okay. Thank you, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and fellow council members for your time tonight. Thank you also to city staff for your hard work um, on this project to get us here. My name is Allison Koo, and I represent the ownership of El Paseo de Saratoga. We are a locally based company that approaches projects with a long-term vision, hence our focus on quality and building community relationships. This is our site plan. The scope of this fully compliant signature project that has been recommended both by staff and planning commission nine to one is only for the 11 acres you see highlighted here. The rest of the center with the large tenants in place, the long-term leases and the retail buildings will remain. It is our priority to keep our tenants operating successfully and for the new development with the, to integrate nicely with the existing center in order to maintain its vibrancy. I wanted to also take the chance to thank the community for their continued engagement on this project over the last three years. They've attended over 40 meetings, both large and small, and their feedback has greatly helped shape the design and direction of our project. We heard from the community that they wanted a pedestrian focused project that would serve as a gathering spot and was warm and inviting. We responded and designed a project that created a main street, Paseo, that is the heart of the project that would be lined with open space, green space, retail, and great outdoor seating. We heard from the community that they wanted a park as D1 is one of the least park districts in the city. We responded and are committing to dedicating approximately one acre of a 100% publicly accessible park. The community expressed that they wanted us to keep the affordable housing on site. That aligns with our company's mission in order to try to solve the regional housing crisis and keep the 150 units of affordable housing on site in this project. Our neighbors also wanted us to protect the existing berm that is there today. Not only are we protecting it, we are enhancing it with additional landscaping more trees and including additional green space along the backside. We heard from the community. They didn't like the school that we had proposed earlier. 
we eliminated it completely. Our closest Elmwood neighbors wanted us to protect their backyards and privacy. We designed generous setbacks well exceeding the daylight plane requirements. This community has lost four grocery stores in the last couple of years, and the community wanted a new one in this project. We delivered that during a pandemic, and we delivered the best, Whole Foods. The neighbors also wanted to see how the project would look when built from their backyards. We delivered and provided custom photo renderings for those neighbors from their individual backyards. We listened, we responded, and we believe that as a result, we have a better project. We have taken great sensitivity in designing our project, but we still have heard concerns about height. I wanted to remind council today that our project is consistent with the other projects that have been approved, other approved urban village projects in the city. This chart illustrates that not only are we consistent, our proposed heights are actually lower than other approved villages in the city. In particular, the urban village at Saratoga and Stevens Creek on the other side of Saratoga Avenue presents very similar circumstances and has approved heights of 150 feet. We are no different from this site and are already surrounded by three sides of commercial uses. This project as proposed is appropriate and consistent with the city's general plan and urban village goals. Finally, I think it is evident that we are designing a project of the highest quality. We are creating a mixed use project here that will serve as the community center. This is where you will wanna come with your family. This is where you wanna bring your out of town guests. And this is where you won't wanna spend your free time. We respectfully request council to vote to move this project forward so that we could bring to reality 150 affordable units, three and a half acres of open space and green space, a whole foods grocery store and much needed housing to this city. Thank you. Thank you. Well, all right. <clears throat> Let's um, go to the community now. Our meeting. What are you doing? If I could ask everybody online to please mute. Wonderful, Tony. Okay, we're going to start with in-person speakers. I'm going to call a few names. When I call your name, head down. First person to the microphone speaks first. Um, Gary Cunningham, Doris Levesi, um, Umbella Nova, and Dave Mark. If the four of you could make your way down, first person go up to the, the microphone. How long do we have to speak? Two minutes. Uh, two minutes. Thank you. Mayor Licardo, uh, Vice Mayor Jones, Council Members, thank you for allowing us to present our views. I'm Gary Cunningham, Vice Chair of District 1 Leadership Group. D1LG is comprised of 26 neighborhood associations and community organizations in D1 and requests that you do not approve as planned the permit applications to redevelop the, a portion of the 30-acre El Paseo Saratoga site. There are over 1,000 nearby residents who are affected by the proposed El Paseo Development Project and are, have currently planned and signed a petition expressing that, those views that they're opposed to it. D1LG supports and recommends an El Paseo Development Project that provides a plan for the entire 30-acre site, not just 10 acres. Brings non-residential and residential density into alignment with comparable projects. Provides for the development of an independent comprehensive multimodal transportation plan and provides for the development of an urban village plan for the area. It's not only El Paseo that's involved in this, this affects on some of the other uh, developments in the area. D1LG requests you consider our recommendation and do not approve the El Paseo de Saratoga development project as currently planned. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Why aren't you talking to me? Gloria? Gloria. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council, wherever you are. I'm Doris Livesey from the Murdoch neighborhood in District 1. There's a misconception that we are NIMBYs. We are not. We do want this project, especially the affordable housing, 
but with reasonable density that is comparable to the other signature projects in the area. 12 stories? Stevens Creek Promenade on a major transit corridor is 63 dwelling units per acre, which is much more appropriate. We do not have transit, transit infrastructure where we are for 2,000 new residents. Please reject this plan and ask the developer to come back with something that's more reasonable for the area. We never had 40 meetings. I was at two that I was notified of. Over 1,000 District 1 residents, um, not all District 1, okay, we've got a letter. Please find attached over 1,000 petition signatures from local residents, over 700 of whom live in District 1, opposing the building heights greater than eight stories at the proposed El Paseo redevelopment project. The petition was developed by residents to highlight the community's biggest project concerns, the heights and residential and the combined traffic input. It's interesting to note that the developer is still showing on the site a map of a beautiful, huge park. And right now there's a little tiny skinny park. Um, people, when we took the petition around, they were overwhelmed. No, 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 there's gonna be a great big park. No, 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 there isn't. Um, we'd like you to look at this and hear our words. Thank you very much. To the clerk, thank you. Next speaker, um, I'm gonna call <clears throat> a few more names. Um, I'm not sure if you're in Bella Nova. I am Umber Umberto Nova. Umberto, oh, that's a yeah. sorry. Um, I have Dave Mark, Christine Headley, Alice Saley, and Christian Hayward. Please <clears throat> come down, go ahead. All right, good evening, council members and mayors. Uh, my name is Humberto Nava, I'm a San Jose resident and a member of Local 9144 here in San Jose. I'm here tonight to ask your support for El Paseo and Saratoga project. This, uh, this project is a great fit for the area of San Jose, attracting and creating permanent jobs, as well as good paying construction jobs with livable wage, healthcare, and retirement for workers, benefiting the community that live here in San Jose, as well as activating the local economy by putting those earned wages back into the very same community. Developer Sand Hill has committed to use a union general contractor putting union members to work um, and drawing manpower from local apprenticeship and invest them in developing the future workforce that are going to cement the middle class in our community with these good paying jobs and avoiding that these workers fall in the public healthcare system by providing a good health care for these workers. This project is also bringing much needed housing for our city with 994 units cutting into our housing deficit and also supporting the growth with permanent job coming to the city of San Jose and sustain our growth goals. I am in full support of 1777 Saratoga El Paseo project and ask for your support tonight. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Hello, hi, Mayor uh, and Vice Mayor Jones and the city council members. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk this evening. My name is Christine Headley. I live in District 1, uh, right behind El Paseo. And I am a school nurse for the County Office of Education, Santa Clara County. And my job as a nurse is to make sure that um, safety is the number one goal with our school districts. So allow me to tell you why this proposal is not safe. Saratoga Ave from 280 to Lawrence Expressway has been identified by the city as a vision zero priority safety corridor. It accounts for a higher proportion of fatalities and severe injuries on San Jose streets due to pedestrian, bicycle, and automobile traffic. Why should we add 2,000 plus families to this area before addressing this problem? My teenage daughter and her friends travel to Prospect High School a block away from the proposed structure. There are already problems trying to get students safely on campus there. The nearest Caltrain, Caltrain station is eight miles away in Sunnyvale, would be a better location for 10, 11, and 12 story buildings. I'm not against housing, but again, as was said before, it needs to be a reasonable height. If this proposal goes through, who will take responsibility for additional injuries and deaths? At the very minimum, please reduce the amount of stories and enact transportation measures so our community can stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. 
Um, also, Eric Holzer, please come down. Go ahead. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Dory Mark. Uh, I also live in the community nearby. I'm a resident of San Jose, and I definitely in favor of, uh, we're definitely in favor of affordable housing in our neighborhood, but I'm against taking more than our fair share of the burden. Um, this, this project is gonna be 12 stories. That's just taller than any building that I've ever seen around. And I can't believe the number of, of, of people that could be moving in uh, to the neighborhood. This affects us directly because I also have children that go to Prospect High. They walk to school every day. It's gonna increase the amount of traffic in the area. We need a better traffic solution uh, for this project. As a matter of fact, there are other projects going up in the area, including a multi-use building um, where the McDonald's is, and I believe a Costco also is in the area. And I'm not sure that they've taken that into account as there will be a lot of traffic in that area where it's hundreds of kids walk from their homes to Prospect every morning and then back as well. Please reject this proposal until a proper independent transit study can be done by the city of Saratoga and Santa Clara County. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the council. My name is Alice Saley, and I am a carpenter apprentice with um, the Carpenters Local 405 here in San Jose. Um, it has always been my dream to become a homeowner here in San Jose, the city where I was born and raised. As a child, my family relied on the Section 8 housing program, and we moved a total of six times before my 18th birthday. And despite graduating from UC Santa Cruz and now having a good paying job as a carpenter, I have yet to attain my dream of home ownership in San Jose. By approving the El Paseo and Saratoga project, you will be helping a lot of residents like myself. This project is unique because it will build 150 on-site affordable homes rather than paying a fee, which is much cheaper for the developer. You will also be helping to generate hundreds of union construction jobs. These jobs would provide local apprentices, including women, minorities, veterans, and at-risk youth. You'll be given the chance to earn a living wage and contribute to literally building San Jose. This is a huge opportunity for San Jose residents to win more good jobs and much needed homes. Please approve the El Paseo Saratoga project and please help us to live and work in San Jose. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna call a couple more names. Um, go ahead and come to the mic. Um, Kim Carson and Doug Cheslam. Please come on down. Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and members of the council. Thank you for allowing me the chance to speak. My name is Christian Hayward, and I have the pleasure of working for DevCon Construction. We're a union shop, and we are looking forward to building this beautiful mixed-use signature project in San Jose. I'm here to respectfully ask you to approve this project tonight. It will provide a wide range of high-quality construction jobs for years to come right here in San Jose. Quite honestly, many in our industry are worried about the job pipeline coming down in the next year or two. In the next year or two. Construction work is down and the prospect for jobs is looking unpredictable for the coming years. By approving this project, you will provide job security for hundreds of workers and their families. And not only that, you will be able to enable us to build a very beautiful mixed use project with parking underground so that neighbors and residents can enjoy outdoor dining, a park, paseos, open space, and even a brand new Whole Foods. The pandemic has shown us how much we value open space and outdoor spaces together, and our weather here in California is perfect for it. This project is the right one at the right time. Post-pandemic, we are all looking forward to gathering together in a special outdoor place like El Paseo. I hope you'll support this project and thank you for your time. Thank you, next speaker. Hello. My name is Eric Putzer, apprentice carpenter, local 505. <clears throat> I moved into San Jose back in 1991, and uh, pretty much I've been here ever since. Uh, I'm also a, a union member, carpenter, and 
you know, I can tell you this much that like living in San Jose, finding housing has been an issue. I have a great paying job now, but I didn't always. And so but the cost of housing would be what it is. And the, the lack of availability becomes difficult, right? I urge you to go ahead with this with this job so that there could be like more housing, right? It's, it's pretty simple. I'll try to be frank here. Uh, 900 units, sounds pretty good. 12 stories, I think it's doable. I hear a lot of arguments here. Uh, I have to go on the side of more jobs, more housing for San Jose residents. You know, San Jose citizens or you know, that, that they can like get a job, you know, for us and the locals. Uh, the guy from DevCon was just saying is, you know, like, man, we need to like boost up uh, the morale pretty much, I guess. Because if, if it looks like there's some sort of uh, bad times ahead, you know, we want to keep our jobs. But when we have a job, we have the money, we spend the money. It makes a big circle, makes everybody happy, per se. That's, it, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Next speaker, um, Manny Diaz, also come on down, and Joe Lopez. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Kim Parson. I'm a real estate broker and financial advisor and a member of the D1 community. I've lived here in this community for 35 years. My concern is the traffic. Today, we've seen a lot of increase over the, I mean, well, not just today, but we've seen a lot of increase over the years. Everything from Harker Academy to Big Park being replaced. Campbell Avenue, Saratoga, and Quito all require several cycles to get through the lights today. We can only imagine what it will look like with an additional 12, several 12 story buildings. I am all for affordable housing. I am all for the contractors being able to work on this project. I just don't believe that at this time, the CEQA requirements have been met, number one. Urban villages are great, but I'm just concerned how we're gonna get around the, the development. Today, it's difficult. I can only imagine what it's gonna look like several years from now. Please decline this proposal until a solution to address transportation is proposed. I look forward to the new businesses and the new neighbors and a better community plan. As a real estate broker and a business owner, I look forward to the opportunities that are coming, but it needs to be done in a better way. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, fellow <coughs> council members and staff. My name is Doug Cheshire, and I'm a senior field representative with Carpenters Local 405 here in San Jose. I represent over 7,700 members here in Santa Clara County. As both a second generation carpenter and 24 year member myself, I'm here tonight to express our support for the El, um, the El Paseo project and remind people of what a difference projects like this make in the lives of working men and women. By partnering with a responsible union contractor, Sand Hill Properties is providing an opportunity that many developers leave out of the equation. Projects like this create jobs with livable wages healthcare and retirement benefits that will leave lasting impact on working families right here in San Jose. Additionally, providing apprenticeship opportunities that helps a variety of individuals, including minorities, women, and at-risk youth obtain the skills necessary to develop a successful lifelong career in the construction industry. Projects like this are also very important part of our regional econ economy, especially in light of COVID-19 and the projected economic conditions. So I ask, or I encourage that you all approve this project. We need more projects like this. San Jose needs more projects like this. Please approve the resolutions before you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Also, Rich Ortega, please come on down. Good evening, Mayor, ladies, gentlemen. All right. Please excuse me, I'm a little nervous. It's uh, speaking in front of people. It's got to shake it inside. All right, good evening. Thank you for allowing me to be here and speak with you in favor of this project. My name is Manuel Diaz. 
I'm a carpenter apprentice and a proud member of Local 405. I was also born and raised here in San Jose. Projects like this in particular are great for apprentices like me that teach valuable skills that only on-the-job training can give. This project being in San Jose is great for lots of reasons, like keeping San Jose's money in San Jose, right? Keep that money going around in circles. Rather it be at the gas station, the lunch truck, or your local corner mom and pop shop. Most of all, the reason why I'm here and hoping you will pass this vote is I'm a father of four, four boys, who is who I'm also who I'm often missing out on sports practices and games and family events, memories that are frankly just irreplaceable, all due to jobs being out of the city or even out of the county. The closer our job sites means more family time. And just to kind of go off of what I've been hearing about, you know, it not being safe and, you know, how is this and that going to happen? All the union jobs that I've been on, very safe. Um, I, I, if it was close to my house, I would have no problem because I know the safety practices that we put into um, providing safety, period, not only for ourselves, but for the community. And just the effort that goes into that, it's, it's uh, sometimes it's crazy, but we do it for, for the safety of everyone and uh, who wants a, an accident, right? So, all right. Um, the closer our job sites means family time. Please support our, our, working, our working men and women and all families in the trades who also share this point of view. And finally, projects like this will allow me to finish my apprenticeship program and work in San Jose, which will help give me the ability to continue to afford to live here, raise my family here in the city that I love. So I urge you all, please pass the vote, move forward with this project. Thank you. And Sam, uh, thank you for all your service you've done and uh, good luck in the rest of your endeavors that you have after this. We all know the good work never stops, right? So keep your head up and thank you for all your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Also have Noe or No Tehran and Laura Drostick. Please come on down. Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Joe Lopez. Um, and I was born and raised here in San Jose, San Jose native. Um, I'm a journeyman carpenter out of local 405. I've been a carpenter for the past 18 years, and out of the last 18 years, I gotta say I've only been I've only worked on three projects in San Jose. I don't like to commute. I don't think anybody here likes to commute any any 20 minutes past to their job. It's a no, it's a no-go. But having to travel to San Francisco, Oakland, other cities, it it's just tiring on a person, on a family. You've heard it from the from the last person who spoke. It's tiring on 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 all aspects. Um, it's been this way for a long time for construction workers in the industry. And so having a project with this magnitude creates works for our, uh, work for our brothers and sisters to work in our own backyards. The benefits that come with a developer that partners with the union gives our members, which are San Jose residents, wages and benefits, job site training for apprentices, uh, less travel time, less pain for expensive gas, the El Paso, uh, uh, will create happier employees as well as rested employees, which results in safe work environments on top of the best quality that we can provide. So tonight I urge you to approve this project um, and thank you for your support. Thank you, next speaker. Tiffany Martinez, also come on down. Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones and members of the council. I am proud to say my name is Richard Ricky Ortega. I am a rank and file carpenter at a local 405, born and raised in San Jose. <clears throat> I'm here to, to support the El Paseo signature project. I hope that the council will vote yes and approve this project tonight. This project will generate hundreds of union construction jobs in San Jose for years to come, leading to economic growth throughout the city. Like many people, I'm worried about a recession coming and this project will provide quality, secure jobs for myself, my fellow workers, despite difficult economic times ahead. It is not often a project of this quality and level of investment into our city comes along. This is a special opportunity in San Jose. I urge you all the support. If it is made in the community, spent in the community, it stays in the community, please support this project. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, next speaker. Um, also, Dave Abraham, come on down. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Noel Teran. I live here in District 7. I am a local 405 member. Um, I'm here to support my union, uh, my city. I'm here to ask you respectfully to approve the El Paso Signature Project. It will bring us a lot of jobs, money for our community, and time with my family. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and members of the council. My name is Laura Drosek. I am a resident, a proud resident of San Jose. I'm a proud also 23 year member of the Carpenters Union Local 405 here in San Jose. The El Paseo de Saratoga Signature Project will provide opportunities for career building local apprentices, including women, minorities, veterans, and at risk youth to begin or continue a highly skilled trained career in the construction industry. I'm here to urge your support for the El Paseo, the Saratoga Signature Project. Thank you. I'm gonna call a few more names. Luann Abrams, Roberta Wicks, um, and Carlos Duran, come on down, go ahead. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and members of the council. My name is Tiff My name is Tiffany Martinez. I have been a member of Carpenters Local 405 for just under five years, and I'm a recent graduate of the Northern California Carpenters Apprenticeship Training Program. I am here tonight in support of the El Paseo project. This project will not only provide hundreds of high quality union jobs, but also 150 affordable housing units. This will provide much needed housing for hardworking people like myself who cannot afford many of the market rate housing options. I hope you will support this project so that working class families can afford to live in this beautiful and thriving city. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Abrahams from uh, Moreland West, which is across the street from this project. Um, so. The community, unfortunately, has not been heard. And uh, I'm sorry to be blunt about it, but the public notice process has been a failure. The posting on site today shows 800 units and five acres of open space. Naturally, many neighbors think this is the plan under consideration. In fact, it was replaced with a denser, less open plan a year and a half ago. Now, the developer claims to have had 40 meetings with residents, but groups who have been watching this project closely are aware of only three. And in those meetings, our input has consistently been, we absolutely support jobs and housing for working families, expanded affordable housing, number one. Number two, all of the buildings in the plan are too high and too dense. But with each iteration of the plan, the project gets higher and denser. So we ask if a variance is granted based on signature project status, but the requirements for signature projects won't be enforced, if the public is misinformed and input from the community can be ignored, and if, as we understand, the developer is actually free to remove the affordable housing component after approval, what actually constrains a developer in San Jose? Please reject this project. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Also, Jordan Grimes, you can come on down. I'm Luann Abrahams. Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, council members, thank you for your time. Thank you for hearing. I'd like to give a shout out to my brothers and sisters from the unions. I'm a proud, proud former member of the AFSCME and was a shop steward. And I know the importance of union jobs. And I'm actually heartened to hear that Sand Hill is a union friendly uh, organization because uh, that's important, as is development of the site. We want to see development there. Uh, it's important. Right now, it's a dead mall, and nobody wants that. What we don't want is a rush to a program project that's inappropriate for the site. It's too small to accommodate the program that Sand Hill has laid out. 
there's inadequate public open space for the 2,000 residents. Ms. Ku talked about how the neighbors asked for a park, so they gave us a park. They are required to put a park in to the signature project. In fact, they have to pay millions of dollars of fees because their park is too small. That is not a community give back. That is a requirement. The current plan, not the one as posted, but the current plan calls for 1.1 acres of parkland, which is this, excuse me, the green area here. And yellow indicates what the developer calls a pedestrian paseo, 1.7 acres of public open space. Planning staff was surprised, however, when we pointed out that in that yellow open space, cars and parking stalls are clearly visible. These are obviously indicated in the white areas. You can see them driving in the circle. You can see them parked here. This is a parking lot, not a paseo. The architect of this project clearly knows that when he designed the signature project that's proposed for Cambrian Plaza, parking and roadways were properly excluded from the open space. Please reject this proposal. Thank you. Hello, Mayor and City Council members. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. My name is Roberta Witte. I'm a member of the English Estates neighborhood. I'm just around the corner from this project. Um, I am for affordable housing and I am for progress and growth in this area, but I'm very concerned about the density and the height. I am for reasonable density and reasonable height. When I take a look at this project, it appears that the below market housing is all in the 1777 Saratoga Avenue building. Again, a tall building, but it isolates the people who are in the affordable housing building. They would have to cross multiple lanes of traffic across Saratoga Avenue to get to the pre-planned shopping area. Frankly, I don't need another grocery store. We already have enough grocery stores right there. Sprouts, I like Smart and Final. I don't want Costco, but that's another issue. Down the street, there's a dollar store, grocery outlet, big lots, all kinds of other grocery stores available. If you drive, the people in that 1777 will have to drive. And when they try to get out of that locked corner of Saratoga, Prospect, and Lawrence, you're going to hit a lot of traffic. That also is a concern of mine. Too dense, too tall. Please reject this proposal as it now stands. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Carlos Duran. I'm a field representative for the NorCal Carpenters Union at, at Local 405 and 9144. I represent over 36,000 members in Northern California. Close to 7,700 of those members live right here in Santa Clara County and San Benito County. As a representative, I speak for all of our members in strong support of approving the El Paseo de Saratoga project and moving it forward through the entitlement process. We support this project because Sand Hill Properties has made a commitment to use a union general contractor. With this commitment comes opportunity, opportunity for local union members to work in the city they live in. When we work where we live, it reduces long commutes and allows us to spend those hard earned dollars back into our communities. This commitment also ensures that construction workers will earn a fair wage and health benefits, not only for themselves, but their entire family. This commitment will also create opportunity for local residents to enter into an accredited apprenticeship. The apprenticeship combined with on-the-job training will allow local men and women to develop valuable skills that will lead to an amazing career in construction. So like my fellow brothers and sisters who are here today, please stand up carpenters, drywallers, millwrights, pile drivers, cabinet makers, hardwood floor layers. We're all here in strong support of this project done by Sand Hill Properties, who's made a commitment to use a union GC and create valuable jobs for local residents. So I urge you to help create opportunity for local San Jose 
local San Jose residents by approving this project and moving it forward. I thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak in support of the Al Paseo de Saratoga project. Thank you, next speaker. Good evening, uh, staff, council, honorable mayor. My name is Jordan Grimes. Uh, I'm here tonight on behalf of the Greenbelt Alliance. We are an environmental nonprofit focused on helping ensure our communities are uh, environmentally sustainable and climate resilient. We're in strong support of the project at El Paseo. Projects like El Paseo are important not only locally to San Joseans, but in fact throughout the entire South Bay and Bay Area region. An abundance of jobs without commensurate home building has resulted in a tremendous imbalance that has sent housing, process, housing prices skyrocketing. As of 2022, this year, the area median income for a family of four in Santa Clara County is a whopping $166,000. Workers have scrambled in response, forcing them to find places further and further away to live. The affordability crisis has severe impacts on our climate as well. It has also trapped our friends, neighbors, and community members into grueling hours-long commutes, during which time thousands of idling and slow-moving cars spew greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. Approving the full project at El Paseo tonight offers Council the chance to make a small but substantial positive impact on both our housing and climate crises. We urge you to do so. Thank you so much for your time. That was our last in-person speaker for now. If anybody else wishes to speak, please fill out a speaker card. I'm gonna move on to the people online. I have 25 hands up currently. We're gonna start with Mark P. Yes, hello. Uh, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, uh, City Council members. My name is Mark Polliger. I'm a District One resident and part of the West Valley Neighbors for Responsible Growth. Thank you for the opportunity to address the council. Uh, we wanna make sure that the council is aware of a letter and report sent to the clerk, council and mayor on June 20th and again on the 21st when no acknowledgement was received. The letter and report concern a significant deficiency in the preparation and content of the environmental impact report or EIR for the El Paseo project concerning the impact of the Whole Foods market as a tenant. The presence of Whole Foods was known but not disclosed in the draft versions of the EIR and its impact not taken into account. And supermarkets and their trucks have significant impact uh, for noise and air quality and should be taken into consideration for any EIR. The developer said in their opening statement they ensured neighbors' concerns are heard and addressed. In the interest of ensuring important impacts on quality and noise impacts on these neighbors are considered and addressed, we recommend the council decline to certify the EIR First Amendment and prepare and circulate an EIR that actually represents the effects of the project. Thank you. Barbara Gaylord. Hello, my name is Barbara Gaylord and I'm a resident of Baker West neighborhood. I live behind the El Paseo de Saratoga project. I'm here to ask that you please reject this proposal. I do support more affordable housing and growth in our neighborhood, but I want more reasonable density and height. 12 stories is too high for our neighborhood. The 30 acre El Paseo parcel of land is a rare opportunity and the city deserves a comprehensive rather than a piecemeal development plan. A comprehensive plan should support San Jose's long-term needs in terms of affordable housing and jobs. We believe it is critical for San Jose to work with Saratoga, Campbell, and Santa Clara County to develop a comprehensive transportation and utility infrastructure plan to support all local development, as well as San Jose's long-term goals on job creation and housing. Please reject this proposal as it stands at this time. Thank you. Julie Reynolds Grab. Good evening, my name is Julie Reynolds Grabby and I am a resident of the Easterbrook neighborhood in District 1. I also have a student who attends Prospect High School and am also concerned about the safety as he rides to and from Prospect every day on his bike. I'm also a former Moreland School District trustee, a neighborhood leader and a former leader of the District 1 leadership group previously mentioned. I find it interesting that union members who don't live in our area are speaking about supporting this project tonight as is. I wanna to make sure 
that it is crystal clear that we, the local residents, also want more union jobs, but not at the expense of safety, green space, congestion, and quality of life for families who already live here. There is a way to achieve better balance on this project, but it's not quite there yet. My concerns, one, lower building heights, eight stories max, 12 stories is redonkulous. Two, less total density. Three, new green space should have at least six acres, which is required, not one acre. And you cannot use local schools for this purpose. Four, better transportation infrastructure. Five, traffic mitigation and safety measures. Six, add more retail space. That means more tax revenue for the city. Seven, not enough parking for proposed residents. Eight, increase affordable units. We should have more than 150 units. I support more affordable housing units in the development, but want less overall density and respectfully ask for reasonable building heights of no more than eight stories. As this project stands, I request that you reject it as it needs more work, specifically including the voice and support of the local community. A successful project will require balancing the needs of local residents, city leaders, and the developer. Thank you for your time and consideration. Um, Mariki Annis, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Hi, yes, this is Marika Annis, uh, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and members of the City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on the El Paseo Signature Project. I have lived in the Baker West neighborhood behind El Paseo for 15 years. I support redevelopment of the El Paseo Center, in particular, the creation of new commercial destinations and that will also create jobs, and very importantly, the creation of affordable housing that our community in the city of San Jose so desperately needs. However, I cannot support the current proposal as the building density and heights are just simply not reasonable. There is a way, as Julie mentioned, to create a much more balanced and appropriate proposal for this site. All along, the proposed building heights and densities have been and building densities have been raised as major concerns of the surrounding residents since the earliest meetings with the developers. You have already heard from many of us about the lack of sufficient transit infrastructure to support this proposed density and the whole and the inadequacy of the allotted park space. Eight stories, I agree with Julie, eight stories is appropriate, not 10 to 12. The building height and density was also acknowledged as areas of known controversy in the draft environmental impact report. Despite this and the clear concerns expressed by the residents, the building heights and densities in this proposal have only increased over time. Please consider the concerns of the community and reject this proposal as currently configured. Thank you. Roberto? Roberto. Uh, good evening. My name is Roberto Aguilera, another local member from 9144. I'm a resident of San Jose for over 15 years. This project will bring me, my family, and local union members to work here in our city. With this opportunity, we can afford to live here while getting health care and working towards retirement. Respectfully help us approve this project and bring more jobs. Ryan. Uh, good evening, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and the members of the San Jose City Council. Uh, my name is Ryan Globus, and I'm a resident of San Jose. And I'm also a member of the South Bay YIMBY uh, organization. And I'm calling tonight to ask you to support this project. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity for the more homes that we desperately, desperately need um, for 150 affordable homes, um, for a great park, you know, the, where I live currently, you know, there's uh, newly built affordable apartments right across the street. And it's definitely increased the vibrancy and the diversity of the neighborhood, uh, adding families and seniors who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to live here. Um, I'm also down the street from a park and it's great walking my dog there every day. And I know that D1 is extremely under parked. And so this is a great opportunity to add more green space. And I'm also within walking distance of a Whole Foods. Uh, and it's great to be able to, to walk over there, get anything I need. They have a coffee bar. Uh, they have events there. Uh, 
so you can't find a good deal there. Um, and it's really improved my relationship with the neighborhood, having the Whole Foods there, having the park there, having the affordable homes here. And I hope that more people in San Jose uh, can live here and can experience uh, all those joys. So please support this project. Thank you. Catherine Hedges. Um, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Hedges. And I'm a member of Cal SV as well as uh, resident of District 3. I'm speaking in strong support of the El Paseo Saratoga project. Um, this project accomplishes the stated goals of the city of San Jose in a way very few other projects do. This proposal will activate and enhance the strip mall and parking lot with nearly a thousand much needed new homes, including 149 affordable homes for San Jose residents who need them the most. Um, <clears throat> San Jose is suffering from a shared housing shortage, which is driving a displacement and affordability crisis. To solve it, we need projects like El Paseo that can deliver homes for people in resource rich areas that will serve residents. I urge you to move this project forward. Um, and this project also includes strong community benefits such as um, the 3.5 acres of green space connected with walking and biking trails, which is really important in the neighborhood. I have tried to bike in that neighborhood the way it is now, and it definitely needs connection of the trails. Um, a lot of people are really excited about the Whole Foods, and um, the property owner has uh, done more than 50 neighbor and community meetings and responded with significant changes. I understand people want a couple of stories cut from it, but you know, I live in a six story building and once buildings get over, you know, three or four stories, they're all just big. <laughs> and they all just have the type of internal layout where nobody gets cross ventilation because they have internal hallways and, you know, you're up past where there's shade on the building. It's all pretty much the same over the third floor. Thanks very much. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I thought this may be a time to try to, uh, I don't know, speak to, uh, you know, the mixed income ideas that I've been trying to understand and learn better about over the years here. Um, can it can it mixed income ideas be applicable to the debate going on for this place at this time? Uh, mixed income ideas are the, is the concepts of how very low and extremely low people of income can live in the same building and area as people who, you know, are of uh, uh, regular income and uh, market rate housing, and. Um, I think that's an interesting concept that can address many issues, including this one. And it's a way to, we can adjust the dial in how exactly we want to uh, build our communities in the future. And it, it gives ourselves choices and flexibility. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's an important concept that I think can help in, in, in the debate that's going on for, for this area and that includes urban villages, and that urban villages should be allowed the concepts of uh, extremely low and, and very low income housing to, to be included. And mixed income can allow that. It doesn't have to be a full overwhelming majority, but it, you know these are practices that can allow you know some. And, and some is better than nothing is my feeling. And it's, you know, we, we have these skills to do this already, it's time we have to uh, reestablish and, and repractice these sort of ideals and ideas. And uh, I think it builds a better community experience for all of us. It, it creates a better idea of sharing and trust and, and builds relationships uh, between different levels of income. Good luck how to work on this idea. Thank you. Ali Saperman. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones and council members. My name is Ali Saperman, and I'm here on behalf of the Housing Action Coalition in strong support of El Paseo. I've shared with the council our formal letter of endorsement. Additionally, among the council offices, you should have received about a thousand letters of support from San Jose residents and members of housing, pro-housing organizations such as Yimby Action, South Bay Yimby, Housing Action Coalition, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, Greenbelt Alliance, and Catalyze SV. What you will hear tonight is that all the groups who aim to address our housing crisis 
believe that El Paseo is an incredible use of land space that will bring nearly a thousand much needed homes to this resource rich area. You've heard from a lot of residents tonight who are mostly wealthy homeowners, but now you will hear from a resident who is a renter. Beyond my role at HAC, I'm first and foremost speaking as a San Jose resident, a district one constituent and a neighbor to El Paseo in the Hathaway neighborhood. I'm a renter in a rent controlled apartment and I'm speaking in enthusiastic support of El Paseo. Half of the project site is already vacant and I'm afraid without this project bringing the much needed vibrancy and activity to this area that this part of district one will become a ghost town. Beyond this, most people can't afford to live in San Jose and if we wanna retain residents, we must find new spaces to house them, especially in affordable homes. This project will create new homes for our middle and lower income neighbors with 149 deed restricted subsidized affordable homes on site. So more people like me can live and strive here. My only critique of the project is that the building height should be much taller so that we can inc include more units. So people like me can enjoy the incredible amenities that this area of district one has to offer. Please support this project without delay. Thank you so much. Michelle. Hello, my name is Michelle Mates. I'm a resident of uh, Baker West Neighborhood Association. I'm actually a neighbor behind the El Paseo uh, project. And I also support affordable housing and growth in our neighborhood. I support our unions. I'm also part of a union. I'm part of the California School Employees Association, uh, chapter 198. Um, I think pretty much, I think most of us are not arguing that we definitely want this area to be developed. The problem is, is a developer since the very beginning has shown one thing and ended up with something else. Um, in regards to the park space, 1.1 uh, acres is far below the park space required for a project of this density, 2,000 people, which actually requires over six acres. That's a requirement. The D1 area has the fewest number of public parks in any district. The developer told the planning commission that residents could use the Moreland School, uh, the Mill Moreland Middle School fields or go over to Prospect to use our outdoor fields. I know for a fact that this is not true. In fact, I, four o'clock, wanted to go over and use the fields and it was chain locked. And anytime you want to go ahead and use the fields, you get this message, all persons entering or remaining on school grounds between the hours of six and five are required to register at the school office. So it's not public, it's private. School property is not the solution. It is controlled by school districts and cannot be considered parkland. The developer will have to pay 18 million in lieu of fees along with a 1.1 acre land dedication, but that does not solve the problem of the lack of open space for 2000 plus residents. Ultimately, the residents of City of San Jose need city leaders to require developers to comply with the general plan and build. Fred Buzo. Hello, uh, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, and City Council. This is Fred Buzo, San Jose Director for Spur. Uh, I'm calling in to uh, voice our support for the uh, project. Uh, you know, Spurs has been a longtime supporter of urban villages, and you know, as you know, signature projects are a key facet to the urban village framework. And unfortunately, you know, signature villages have been few and far between over the past uh, several years, or really since the uh, adoption of the policy. And so, when when you have an opportunity to adopt an urban village, to approve an urban village, uh, we are strongly in support of of doing so. And you know, it's one of these things that uh, while a, a lot of the focus has been on, on building heights and or lack of park space and or affordable housing, uh, you know, there's a criteria set forth for signature projects. And uh, in our opinion, uh, we agree with uh, the recommendations set forth by staff that this does fit within the criteria of uh, signature projects. And, and I don't believe that criteria is up for debate today. It is what it is. And so uh, we feel confident that uh, that the developer is acting in good faith and will continue to work with the community as they uh, further develop uh, the site. And uh, we also look forward to working with the city of San Jose as they move forward in planning the entire uh, El Paseo de Saratoga urban village. Thank you. Julie.
Julie share. Hi. Yes. Hello, Mayor and City Council. My name is Julie share and I'm a San Jose resident living about south, uh, one mile south of El Paseo. Um, I support everything that's good about this project and I don't support the extreme heights or density. Mostly the height is the part that I have the most problem with. But, for, but today I'm going to speak about one of the issues um, and the previous speaker just talked about how this project meets all of the criteria for the signature project, but I do not agree. I believe that they have not met the criteria for job creation. The proposal doesn't meet signature project criteria because the jobs are meant to be above average for the area. The number of jobs have to be above average and the EIR process described the uh, project description having 660 new jobs, which sounds wonderful and amazing, but that is not true, unfortunately. Um, I pointed out the calculation error and now the final EIR is corrected and states that there are 190 net new jobs. So I'm questioning, does uh, 2000 new residents compared to 190 new jobs, does that meet the signature project requirement for above average job creation? I would rather see more jobs here, more permanent jobs, not construction jobs. Construction jobs are great, but that is not what we need for the future. So please uh, reject this proposal until it uh, meets the signature project requirements. Thank you. Ramesh? Yeah, hi, uh, dear mayor, vice mayor, and city council members. Thank you for providing the opportunity to speak at this meeting. My name is Ramesh Puna, a resident of West San Jose who lives in the neighborhood where the project is proposed. As part of the West Valley Neighbors for Reasonable Growth, I ask the city to not approve the project or certify the EIR as it stands. There is a significant deficiency identified in the EIR analysis. In the draft EIR that was circulated, the occupancy of a large supermarket like Whole Foods, which is about 40,000 square foot, was not disclosed. And an EIR analysis was done assuming generic non-grocery commercial use. The environmental impacts from a supermarket like Whole Foods is far significant and I request you to consider our independent analysis report that has been submitted to the city and to the council member with regards to the missed aspects of the EIR analysis that has been done. So once again, please do not approve this project or certify the EIR as it stands today. Thank you. Donna? Donna Ewan. I'm Donna Ewan, a Baker West resident, and I live three blocks behind the El Paseo project. I have two major concerns, parking and traffic. With 994 residential units and 1.25 parking spaces designated for each unit, where will the overflow of cars park if many of the residents have more than one vehicle? As residents, we do not want the overflow of the parking to flow onto our neighboring streets. The residents are also not satisfied with the traffic analysis report that was commissioned by the developer as part of their draft environmental impact report. If the Costco development occurs at the Westgate West Shopping Center, an additional 874 cars could be on the road. With 994 residential units from the El Paseo development, that could potentially have as many as 2,000 plus residents. The traffic analysis report that was commissioned by the developer says that during the AM commute hours, there will only be 219 new outbound trips by residents, assuming that there are 1,100 residences. That means only 14 to 20% of the residents will commute at the peak AM hours. We do not agree with the traffic analysis report that the developer has commissioned. Our neighborhood association has created a petition and we request that the city of San Jose address the combined traffic impact from this project together with the newly proposed Costco development at Westgate West, the former OSH site, 
and three high density housing projects at Quito Village, Cross, Saratoga and Lawrence, and Saratoga and Cox. Before this project comes to a council vote, please make sure that a thorough traffic study has been conducted. And if the recommendation is to reduce the number of residential units. Vince Rocha. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Vince Rocha. I'm the Senior Vice President of Housing and Community Development with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, representing employers in the innovation economy from our largest employers to startups. Our, and I wanna say that our members are proud to support this project because it will address our critical housing needs with over a thousand new homes, 150 of those affordable, create some vibrant outdoor space and a community serving grocery store. I would like to say everyone agrees we have a high housing crisis and are in dire need of affordable housing. Everyone also agrees that we are in a climate crisis. The solution to both is to build densely on underutilized urban infill sites like this one. We simply cannot ignore the scale of our housing need. In fact, the Association of Bay Area, Bay Area Governments has allocated San Jose over 62,000 housing units for the 2023-2031 RENA cycle. To meet the scale of our housing challenges, San Jose has 60 urban villages that'll help us meet the bulk needs. I served on the San Jose General Plan four-year review task force, and one of the things we did with our urban villages was eliminate horizons like that were previously on urban villages like this one, so we could create the much-needed housing uh, faster and quicker on this underutilized land. So I want to thank you in consideration of our comments and support of this project. Bob Levy. Yes, good evening. My name is Bob Levy. I'm a D1 resident, former planning commissioner, and a member of the 2040 task force. I urge you to reject the current proposal. In order to approve the project, you must make the finding that the project is a signature project. This project does not meet the criteria required to be a signature project. Signature projects are to set an example for future development. The project represents only 6% of the overall urban village, 6%, yet consumes over 100% of the residential units identified within the general plan for the urban village. This project is planned without any consideration at all for the remaining portion of the urban village. The project provides the bare minimum of affordable housing units as required by law and at the upper end of the AMI spectrum. The project provides inadequate parkland 6.9 acres of parkland is needed to mitigate the impacts of the project. The project is proposing 1.1 acre, acreage that will likely not be accepted by the Parks Department. It's very likely this project will have no publicly owned parkland. The project, the, the general plan states over and over again that urban villages and signature projects are designed to remedy the city's jobs housing imbalance. This project does exactly the opposite. It provides housing for over 2,000 new residents and only 190 new jobs. Signature projects must include broad and diverse community engagement. The public engagement portion of this project was woefully inadequate, as is evident by tonight's testimony, the letter from the Neighborhood Association presidents, the D1 leadership group, and a petition with over 1,000 sign signatures. The project fails to meet the criteria required for a signature project. The only exemplary feature of this project is the ability to squeeze as many units on a parcel of land as possible while providing a minimum of amenities required. Please send it back to the drawing board and, and require a plan for the entire urban village. Ahmad Thomas. Um, Ahmad, your Zoom is out of date. What you're gonna need to do is um, sign off, update your software, come back in, re-raise your hand. Um, there are a lot of speakers still ahead of you, so you should have enough time to get back in. Um, Soba Rao. Dear San Jose Mayor and Council Members, my name is Shobha Rao. I'm a resident of Moreland West neighborhood and a parent. Like other wonderful residents and neighbors that spoke before me, I want to support more growth and all the new jobs that come with it in the area. But I want it to be more reasonable with more traffic study and infrastructure added to support the density. Do you know many students, many kids actually walk and bike to prospect today? The bike infrastructure today in this area is not sufficient already. Saratoga Avenue and Lawrence Expressway, as you know already, are extreme caution. And Prospect Road is dangerous at any time of the day. 
and you want to add more to the mix by adding 12-story residential buildings. While the developer is building protected bike lanes around the project perimeter, which is great, they don't lead to any such connected protected lanes on Saratoga or Lawrence. I feel this lack of comprehensive planning will lead to real life problems for all residents. Um, hence, I strongly urge you to reject the current proposal as it stands so we can have a well-balanced and well-thought-out plan that will benefit everyone. Thank you. Adam Sweeney. Hi, everyone. My name is Adam Sweeney. I'm a D1 resident. I've lived in the Happy Valley neighborhood just across prospect from, from this project for the last 18 years. I'm one of those rich homeowners that, that someone mentioned. Uh, and I want to speak in support of this project. We have a great neighborhood. We have houses like mine. We have duplexes, apartments, makes for a great mix of, of families and, and income levels for the kids in our schools. My kids went to schools in the Moreland district, uh, both graduated from Prospect High School, never had any problems walking to school, crossing Lawrence, did it for four years each. Uh, and I think our, our area is a great place to add as much housing as we can. Uh, we have retail, we have entertainment, we have restaurants that we enjoy all the time. I think there's a great place to bring more people into San Jose. I think tall buildings are appropriate for an urban village like ours. This is the place where they need to go. Where else could they go if not here? Um, and frankly, we need more housing. The, the, the prices of housing in our area, as everyone knows, are totally out of control. I would like my kids to be able to live in our neighborhood. And today, they can't. So please say yes to more housing in San Jose and support this project. Thank you very much. David Meyer. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Ricardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and members of the San Jose City Council. Uh, my name is David Meyer, and I represent Silicon Valley at Home, which is an affordable housing advocacy organization that works all across the county. And on behalf of SVA at Home, we are happy to support the El Paseo de Saratoga proposal before you tonight. Um, both of the council, member, uh, council memos regarding this proposal that have been released raise important points and opportunities. The core of all of this, though, is that this proposal will bring 994 new homes to San Jose, including 149 deed restricted affordable homes, making one of the largest current residential proposals in the city. This development anchors the future update of the village plan and vision for the neighborhood and will serve as a catalyst to further development. Any reductions in densities or heights at this stage of the process would undermine not only the affordable units slated for development, but the city's goals of using urban villages to advance residential development across San Jose. El Paseo de Saratoga is a key opportunity to make good on San Jose's commitment to cite more affordable housing opportunities all across the city to provide access to people of all incomes and backgrounds and truly help address housing equity across the city. So we urge you to approve this proposal without delay. Thank you very much. Matt Hess. Uh, thank you, Mayor Licardo. Thank you, Vice Mayor Jones and members of the council. My name is Matt Savage and I lived in the District 1 Council for five years. Uh, I moved two years ago. I could no longer afford to live in that neighborhood. I actually lived in a Hathaway neighborhood, about a half mile away from this project, but my family and I moved to District 6. And we were lucky we could move, but I'm worried that more and more families won't be able to live anywhere in San Jose because it's getting too expensive. We need more housing in San Jose. We need more housing everywhere in San Jose. We need middle-class families to be able to afford to stay in San Jose. Thank you. Mike Goff. All right, good evening, um, Mayor Licardo, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Jones and council members. Um, thanks for the time to, to speak tonight. First time doing something like this. So I appreciate being part of the process. I'm a father of uh, two kids under five. And as we've started kind of raising our young family um, uh, here living in the, the Moreland neighborhood, um, just a block away from the site, uh, I've kind of gone and looked at parks and other places that we could spend a lot of kind of family time. And it's been a struggle. I mean, um, a lot of times we 
essentially end up getting out of the car and having to drive I don't know, a mile or two to, to find um, another location to kind of to go and play at rather than having a, an easily accessible neighborhood park. Um, a couple other people have mentioned similar types of things about uh, District 1 um, having kind of a lack of park space uh, throughout. And so I was excited um, when I saw the redevelopment notices go up a year or two ago that, that this would be an opportunity to gain some of that. And, uh, and it does seem like there's some gain. Um, but there's also quite a bit of additional uh, density. And I feel like both for myself and the surrounding neighborhood, as well as for the, the new residents that would be coming in, a lot of us, again, are just going to be jumping in the cars, um, having to go off and, uh, and drive a bit, which is unfortunate um, that we're not able to create something um, more local and, and kind of goes against what I believe is kind of the long-term vision of the city. Um, so I would ask that you guys uh, not currently, not propose, not accept, um, uh, the plan proposal as it currently stands um and uh and that hopefully the developer would come back with uh with something that does create that uh that feeling um for my families like myself and others thank you john baker west thank you mayor licardo and council members i'm a baker west resident and i need to raise details about this plan's affordable housing the Baker West and Moreland West neighborhoods have been in consistent support of affordable housing. However, this project maximizes the market rate housing at 185 units and delivers only the bare minimum of below market rate units. None of the 149 below market rate units actually include the lowest AMI income tier. Our neighborhoods have in fact actually asked for better alignment to all of the city's RENA income targets. Most, if not all, the BMR units in this project are located in the quote unquote affordable tower separated by six lanes of traffic from many site amenities. Unlike the other three buildings in the project across the street, the affordable tower is in a commercial island separated by six lanes of traffic in every direction out from that tower. According to a 2019 planning department memo, the two sites required two separate signature project applications. We have in fact asked that the 149 BMR units be kept in any plan revision, but don't assume that the below market rate units will be built. In a recent meeting with the planning department, we were told that even if you approve this project, the 149 units could still be replaced by in lieu fees at a later date. Are we the only San Jose citizens who actually read, noticed, and care about these equity issues? Our affordable housing concerns don't come from any affluence, as, as some have alluded to in this meeting. They actually come from our own difficulties with housing and our own experiences. I would ask you, based on these equity shortfalls, please reject this plan. Thank you. Adam Coslin. Hello, my name is Adam Coslin, speaking on behalf of Whole Foods. Whole Foods is extremely excited to be part of this project and is speaking in support. Uh, we are excited to bring uh, good paying jobs, a, a wide array of uh, food and beverage options, as well as significant su community support in the form of uh, Whole Foods Associated Foundations and other measures uh, to this portion of San Jose. We're excited to be part of a large development, bringing additional uh, affordable housing, as well as relief to the overheated housing market. We are further uh, excited to be part of a project that provides green space and walkability to the neighborhood. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be, to be part of this project, I strongly support the council moving forward, uh, but would like to reiterate that uh, our ability to be part of this project is, con is uh, conditional on the ability of the pro of the council to move forward with this project uh, and so uh, are looking forward to being involved if and when this project uh, is approved. Thank you very much. Kathy Oberstar. I'm good evening mayor and Lucardo and city council members. I'm Kathy, a resident of Baker West, and I support more affordable housing in our neighborhood, but I'd like more reasonable building density and height restrictions. The residents care about affordable housing. We advocated to increase the percentage of BMR housing to this planning commission. 
This project promises the bare minimum required of 15% below market rate unit, yet it still doesn't conform with the city's RENA allocation. Please reject this proposal as it stands at this time. In addition, our neighbors have joined together, not in, we, we support the development and we want progression in our groups. We now have just gained um, and really has worked together as, as uh, leaders here and we really want um, eight stories density as a maximum. Thank you for your time. Lalo Mendez. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Lalo Mendez and I'm the Development Project Specialist for Catalyze SV. I'm here this evening on behalf of our PAC members who reviewed and provided feedback on this project in October of 2020 and later in March of 2021. This project is exactly what our members want to see in San Jose. More homes, including 150 affordable homes, a grocery store and benefits for the residents of San Jose. Our members want to urge you to approve this project tonight with the following four recommendations. One, provide one-to-one -one bicycle parking ratio to secure bike stations and promote connections to public transit. Two, designate more parking areas as EV charging stations. Uh, number three, provide on-site residents with transit passes to encourage the use of alternate, alternative modes of transportation. This is especially important because this is a bicycle-oriented development, and it goes along the lines of the parking reductions and PDM frameworks, which was approved last week. And number four, make this project at least uh, LED goal, so it's a more sustainable uh, development. So on behalf of our members, I strongly urge you to approve El Paseo de Saratoga without modifications to the density. Council members, we can't wait our way out of this housing crisis. We have to move forward. Please approve El Paseo this evening. Thank you very much. Bob and Lisa Fanjoy. Um, you, uh, Bob and Lisa, you guys need to update your software in order to speak at the meeting. <laughs> Sorry, Gary Smith. Yes, good evening, council members and Mayor Licardo. I'm Gary Smith. I'm president of the English Estates Neighborhood Association, a group of five or six streets just north of Prospect High School, High School and adjacent to Prospect Road. I do not support the proposal as it's presented. I do uh, support uh, reasonable growth, reasonable housing heights, I very much support affordable housing, and I'm hoping that um, residents of all 60 urban villages are listening tonight um, to glean from what we're saying. Um, my recommendation, um, I've heard this week that uh, the, the city council is considering putting a footbridge over Saratoga Avenue. I think that's a great idea. I encourage you to do that. I also encourage you to um, do the very same thing over Keto Road. Keto Road in this development is called Keto Road. You could also call it the on ramp to Lawrence Expressway driving north and the off ramp of Lawrence Expressway driving south. Building one, which will be an 11 story building with a setback of about zero to five feet, will be parallel to that. There'll be what, 120 some residents in there. There'll be an, an in ramp and an on ramp coming out onto Keto Road. Let's build a bridge over Prospect Road as well. Those are two bridges. Let's make that a condition of this project going forward. We care about people's lives. Everybody on this call from every 60 uh, urban villages in San Jose, please glean from what we're saying. San Jose in 2015 joined uh, the Vision Zero program. We can do that. We can be part of a zero collision city. That's very important. We care about our children, our families. Let's do this properly. Thank you. Federico. Hi. I'm another rich homeowner in D6. I see a lot of commentary for and against. We can see that there's a moral aspect to this project dealing with housing access, as well as some really heartfelt comments by San Jose Labor. The project has been pending since 2019 and we need new housing now. The people of San Jose cannot wait for housing. 
The major thoroughfare, which can really benefit from density and height, the local businesses can hugely benefit from additional customers within walking distance. Height and density in this new development can really create a community with a mixed income and diversity of residents. There's some great comments about lack of park space. This is currently a parking lot and we'll have a park immediately with new park development to come. If we're worried about parking overflow, can we not implement a parking pass system in the neighboring streets? It seems we have solutions at hand to our concerns and a huge opportunity for new housing and amenities for San Jose. Please vote yes for this project. Thanks. Alex Shore. Hi, this is Alex Shore, Executive Director of Catalyze SV. You know, work trip in Boston calling in today because this project is so important to me and to Catalyze SV members. I grew up in Saratoga. I went to this shopping plaza when it was in its previous iteration. So I care very deeply about what happens here. And I also feel for some of the neighbors who spoke tonight who expressed concerns and fears about this development. I understand where those perspectives come from. Yet I would say that the need for affordable housing is the greatest issue in our community right now. I am at a conference on US competitiveness among cities and San Jose, I'm glad to say, is doing really, really well compared to other cities, except on one really important metric on housing. We don't have enough housing for all the people who want to live here and for all the people who already do live here. And it is literally displacing our kids and our grandkids, and it will get worse if we don't build the amount of housing we need. I am thoroughly supportive, as our members are, of the memo from the council block adding in transit passes. It will help reduce traffic in the neighborhood. We have to keep things like those in mind as benefits to making the project as good as possible. I'm very grateful for all the council members, including Esparza and Arenas, for talking about the moral imperative of more housing, particularly affordable housing on this site. This project needs to be approved tonight. We need to make it as good as possible. And thankfully, the council has heard the community's concerns, has heard the opinions of Catalyze SV members, and is on the precipice of approving a great project. Thank you so much. Michael Wright. Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor Ricardo and uh, uh, City Council. Just wanna say I'm supportive of low-income housing. Um, just ask that if there's anything left to take care of with this, I'm very concerned about the traffic increase that will take place from this, especially with the Costco possibly going in. Um, it is a very busy section there and our kids go to Easterbrook. They'll be going to Prospect eventually a few years from now. And so I want to make sure it's a safe uh, location to be able to get to school and back. Um, this project obviously is going to happen soon. And um, yes, very supportive of it, but uh, do consider the concerns of the neighbors uh, in the various districts uh, that will be impacted by the project. Thank you very much. Serum. Shri Shriram. Hi, good evening, Mayor Ricardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and honorable members of the San Jose City Council. Thank you for the, I thank you for the opportunity to speak here. My name is Sriram Chatrati, and I'm a D1 resident in the Moreland West neighborhood. I live less than half a mile from the proposed site, and we've been living here for the last 22 years where we've raised both of our daughters who graduated from Prospect High School. As you've heard many times this evening, we neighbors actually do welcome this project. I'm not a NIMBY proponent at all. I actually welcome this project in our backyard, but the backyard is way too small for a project of this scale. Public transportation is inadequate in this area with only one bus line providing a 15 minute headway, two others with much more limited service. In addition to the 2000 new residents, this project brings a destination store and shoppers are not going to walk or take a bus to go to Whole Foods. That's new traffic. Providing new residents with VTA bus passes is a nice idea, but they will find them of little use without major upgrades to the bus service levels and stations. As you could see, 
This site can reasonably accommodate about eight stories worth of residences. The current proposal of 12 stories is way over provision for this site. Please reject this proposal as it stands at this time, do keeping in mind that we do welcome the overall development, just not the way that it is currently provisioned. Thank you deeply for your consideration. Have a good evening. Sean Dobson. Hello, my name is Sean Dobson. I'm a project manager at DevCon Construction. Uh, once again, on behalf of DevCon, we are in strong support of the El Paseo project, and we are excited to be a part of this development and look forward to constructing such iconic buildings in the city of San Jose. I grew up in the San Jose area and attended high school a couple miles down the road from this proposed project site. As all of you know, San Jose housing is extremely expensive and many families face difficulty finding housing and being able to afford housing for themselves and their families. This development will provide new affordable housing opportunities for families located near great schools, services, and a large variety of job opportunities. In addition, this project will create hundreds of union jobs for workers over the next several years during construction of this new development. Thank you for your time and consideration for this project. Neighbors FIB. Hello there, this is Neighbors for Intelligent Development, most from District 1. We all agree we need housing and parks, but this is not that project. Please everyone take off their blinders and see more than affordable housing in this project. People seem willing to forget everything else for affordable housing. Remember, we built low income housing with many union jobs and work at that time. And we gave up a huge park promised back to us by the city of San Jose. Sam and Chapa remember that, where's the park? We will show you the critical differences from other signature urban projects. Some of the projects may be missing one thing. This project comes short on multiple items. Project is not near freeways. Like other projects, well over a mile away to any of the entries to the freeways. Nothing close. Worse yet, access roads to the freeways are way too small. Quito Road is only a one-lane road. Don't believe their pictures where they're showing four and five lanes on Quito. Only one lane. Campbell Avenue, two lanes only. Saratoga Avenue, two lanes both ways. No urban village has only one lane on one side of it, and also the parking entrance is only accessible from one side of Quito. This is the main entrance to underground parking and the only entrance you do not have to transverse parking lots to get to it. Get ready for major illegal U-turns and cutting through all the neighborhoods. No meaningful mass transit. No train, no BART, no light rail. Only a bus, no one rides. Giving passes won't help. People did not ride it when it was free and you didn't need a pass. That means driving everywhere. No close parks, freeway, etc. No park. Where's the park? And, and 0.6 alleyway for the homeless and a puny half acre circle? That's not a park. That's an embarrassment. We gave up acres and acres of parkland and open space when we built the low-income housing. We had a park horse on both sides of Campbell Avenue and a community garden. The city of San Jose promised us we would get a new park to replace what we lost on the next project. Well, here's the project. Where's the park? Not even close to pedestrian. Jeffrey? Hello, uh, good evening. My name is Jeffrey Herdman and I'm a local district one renter working in entertainment. Our city faces an acute housing crisis. Personally, it's hurt to see my friends and coworkers struggle to make ends meet because of the housing costs. Worse still, several of them have been pushed out of the air area entirely during the pandemic, never to become a long-term resident who could send their kids to school here or enjoy the opportunities within our city. Uh, continued inaction, endless studies, and project downsizing is hurting an entire generation of workers and young parents and sabotaging our future uh, potential as a great city. This project is a step forward in alleviating, alleviating the housing burden for present and future residences, residents, and I ask that the council please move forward with this project. Thank you very much. Ron Leckie. My name is Ron Leckie, and I've lived here in Saratoga Woods for the last 33 years. I support the need for the El Paseo site to be revitalized since the area in question has been turned into a ghost town. But I do want to see a plan that is more reasonable in terms of density and height. I have several 
significant concerns about the impact that the current plan will have on us. Our neighbourhood's primary egress is onto Saratoga Avenue, which is the main thoroughfare from Highway 85 to El Paseo. Although we're in Saratoga, not San Jose, our home is about 500 feet from El, Pase El Paseo. The increased proposal in terms of density at El Paseo will add significantly to the traffic congestion. Combine this with San Jose's plan Costco to be located in Westgate West, and then Saratoga's own housing element plan, these will all have an unbearable negative impact on the traffic and safety in our area. I haven't seen any attempt to coordinate those multiple projects and look at the traffic impact. Uh, little thought has been given to it that I can see, and I, I hope that that will be investigated. I request that you reject the current plan and require the developer to go back work with other cities and submit a better plan for that addresses these requirements. Thank you. Justin. Justin, you need to update your Zoom software. Um, Zoom user. Zoom user, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. My name is Shelley Hoyt, and I'm a longtime resident of Moreland West neighborhood. I support the redevelopment of the center, but want more reasonable density and height. Community involvement has been driven primarily by the neighbors, not by the developer. There have been long waits for information and especially drawings. Communication and meetings have been mostly limited to the residents immediately adjacent to the site and do not take into account the nearby neighborhoods that will be impacted by this project. Whatever input that we have given has not resulted in influence over our major concerns, the height and density driving a huge strain on the infrastructure. <clears throat> People have mentioned so many things. I, I, I'm empathetic to all of the contract workers and, and the union members, but it seems to me that we can approve this project with modifications like no more than eight stories, and maybe, you know, 90% of the people will be happy. The neighborhoods will be able to support the project, and the union workers will be able to have their work. There's more than one way to do this. Um, but I urge you to reject this proposal as it currently stands and have modifications made that everybody, can, that most everybody can get on board with. Thank you. Amy Cody. Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones and council members. My name is Amy Cody and I'm president of the Moreland West Neighborhood Association. I'd like to use my time to discuss community outreach and incorporation of community input. The proposed El Paseo project will greatly impact our entire commercial area and the neighborhoods around it. But affected residents did not have the benefit of broad community outreach that occurs with the development of an urban village plan. Moreland West is located across the street from the El Paseo shopping center, and it took four months to get a meeting with the developer. The developer did attend neighborhood meetings that we organized but the increasingly tall and dense plans did not reflect the top two concerns of our residents. In follow-up conversations, I regularly reminded the developer about the community's long-standing request for a rendering that shows the entire site, all four buildings, so the public can visualize what is being proposed. This was not provided. Most renderings we've seen are close up, inspirational or conceptual, the developer submitted architectural drawings to the city in December, which we looked forward to seeing at community meeting number two, hosted by the planning division in January. Rather than show all four buildings, the developer chose to show a single building, the shortest one at nine stories. To be clear, we're not talking about a nine story or a 12 story building. What's being proposed are four massive buildings with six towers, nine, 10, 10, 11, 11, and 12 stories more appropriate for the transit-oriented Stevens Creek Corridor. We're talking about over 2,000 new residents, only 190 new jobs, minimal affordable housing, zero units for our very low income population, grossly insufficient park space, 
in a park deficient area. We encourage you to not support this project as currently planned. Marcella? Hello, and thank you for listening to me. Um, I'm a lifelong local citizen that invested in the region within walking distance of Val Paseo. I'm also um, a real estate finance person for development corporations with a long career in it locally. And I guarantee this project has numerous high impact flaws. In addition, recent research for my career shows that demand for commercial real estate is expected to settle at only 26% in the Bay Area, 26% of what it was pre-pandemic. And with that, the demand for housing is also expected to drop significantly from pre-pandemic numbers because employees are demanding to work remotely um, and employers are catering to that. On top of all that, the City Planning Commission, um, they decided to approve this project using Target's parking lot, the schools for park space, and two members talked about moving into the affordable housing portion of the project, which is an inherent conflict of interest that I find egregious. So please reject tonight's proposal and go back to the drawing board. We can build something appropriate for our neighborhood. Ahmad Thomas. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and council members. My name is Ahmad Thomas, and I'm the CEO of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. On behalf of our member companies and the innovation economy, we are proud to support the project before you today. Our business leaders have long been clear that for our economy to thrive, we need housing at all income levels, and this project delivers that. This project will deliver a much needed 994 new homes, 149 of those being deed restricted affordable housing. And all of this on a currently underutilized retail center. It will breathe new life into that space with a new grocery store anchoring the project. Thank you for your consideration of my comments this evening. I am grateful to be able to speak in support of housing and this impactful project. Neil Park McClintock. Hello, uh, my name is Neil Park McClintock, uh, mayor, members of the city council. I am actually um, the president of Cupertino for all, and I live in Cupertino, so I don't live uh, nearby the property, um, but I did find a lot of similarities between this project and things I've seen in my own city. Um, in relationship, you know, you hear a lot of reasonable height versus reasonable density. Well, we're kind of a job center, we're an urban center. So if anything, our past densities haven't been reasonable. And so we have to catch up. Um, there's a reason that property values have risen so much um, for the folks who are calling in um, opposition to this project. And that is because we have a huge housing shortage and because we haven't been using reasonable density um, despite our rapid growth. And additionally, I'm someone who is in a precarious housing situation. So I'm actually housing insecure. And I might end up coming to San Jose from Cupertino because it is a little bit cheaper. Um, and so it'd be great to have various housing options. And I think my story is also the story for many who already kind of live in your communities. And so people don't just come from the outside and sort of invade San Jose. They come from parts of the, the county already. They come from nearby often. And so like I'm down the street. Um, and so we should open our doors to all folks um, and think of ourselves as a collective community and region. And I think this project is a step in that direction as well. Um, additionally, we can have density while also promoting walking and biking. 
some of our most dense or safest uh, areas in San Jose are actually where there is more density. Um, we just have to design them better and not orient ourselves entirely around cars as well. Thank you very much. And I hope the council supports this project. Gail Miller. Hi, my name is Gail Miller and I'm a longtime resident of District 1. I own my own home. I'm an older person. And I feel that this El Paseo is out of characteristic for this neighborhood. It was always or two or three story apartment houses. Now you're building a high density apartment house. And also it's gonna be an impact on traffic, air pollution and pedestrian traffic. And also you're not considering the older population in this area. And I feel uh, with the traffic congestion, it'll create um, accidents and it'll be very hard on pedestrians. And also there's a big impact on PG&E and water. And it will be very hard. And I, again, I think the project should be rejected. Thank you very much. Eugene Bradley. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Eugene Bradley, Silicon Valley Transit Users. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. By the way, I was just looking at this particular project. One speak about two speakers ago, somebody said that there's people coming from all over the county that want to move it to San Jose. I'm someone that's been priced out not only of San Jose, but now priced out of Santa Clara County. So nowadays I'm in Monterey County. Anyway, looking at this project, is it perfect? No, nothing is perfect. What I feel from what I've seen with the facts on this, as well as the testimony from both sides is there can certainly be improvements. One thing about the traffic though, that one other speaker brought up, even though there is several bus lines that BTA runs right now, including one express bus, that express bus only runs twice in the weekday morning and then twice in the weekday evening. There's no weekend service. And also, even with BTA's proposed plans, there's actually some Saturday and Sunday service that, that would be, that's proposed to being reduced. So I'll, while I'd like to see this project go through as it's much needed affordable housing in San Jose, there certainly needs to be some improvements around the area to further enable people to walk, bike, or even take the bus. I was somebody, I say this as somebody who when I was living in Sunnyvale, I take the 26 bus down to help us out to Saratoga to watch movies. So this is proof that there are people who ride the bus. Thank you very much. So let's move forward with this project and let's also make sure we provide the proper improvements to enable everybody, as many people as possible, not only afford the development, but also be able to walk, bike, or take the bus and not have to depend on car to drive everywhere. Thank you. Lisa Fanjoy. Yes, hi, uh, Bob Fanjoy here. I'm a District One resident as well, and a uh, long time. And uh, I'm a founding board member and past president of the Murdoch Neighborhood Association. We're uh, probably a mile or two away up uh, Lawrence Expressway from where this project would be. Um, I'm going to urge you to please vote no on this project as proposed. I think you've heard from a lot of people that we are for developing the El Paseo site, but not as currently planned. There's been many changes to it and has not addressed the top two neighborhood concerns that have already been mentioned. Um, this project is way too large in size and scope and does not meet the needs of the surrounding neighborhoods. This project would increase traffic congestion congestion, which will already be strained by the new Costco planned at Westgate West a few blocks away. The surrounding roads and infrastructure do not support the addition of 2000 plus new residents living in approximately 1000 high density apartments in this area. Uh, respectfully, we do not want another Santana Road in this neighborhood. We already have one at Santana Road. We do not want another Winchester housing project like the one currently under construction off 280 and Winchester in our neighborhoods. We do not want 11 to 12 story buildings in West San Jose, like the awkward looking Prune Yard Tower in Campbell. 
sitting all by itself. The city of Sunnyvale has a limit uh, building height for a reason uh, to prevent unre unrestricted growth by developers who do not live here. So take a look at the eight, what the eight neighborhood associations are telling you, please. And uh, I'd like to borrow from uh, Matt Mahan. Let's have a revolution of common sense about this project and not approve it as is. Thank you. Justin. Oh, good. I'm back. I guess my software is working. Yeah, so um, I've heard a lot of uh, flowery talk here. Uh, great stuff. Um, I've heard real estate developers and building trade unions appealing to people's kinder, gentler impulses. We hear a lot of talk about housing affordability. We hear people talking about park space. Well, we talked about how much park space there is, and let's just say there's not very much. Um, we have developers who want to build um, you know, hundreds of units of housing, and they're saying, oh, well, there's going to be affordable housing. Well, the thing is, these are not people who are motivated by social good or some sort of happy fantasy about what an urban village can be. These are people who want to make a lot of money. And the primary beneficiaries of this project are not going to be people in this area. They're not going to be people in San Jose. They're going to be people in Woodside and Los Altos and probably San Francisco, Los Angeles, you know, whatever private equity firms are bankrolling the whole thing. And they're selling it to us as though it's some sort of social good. I think it's time for us to be realistic and say, okay, we have people who are trying to, you know, appeal to our noble and kinder impulses. But at the end of the day, we're talking about people who are motivated by naked financial self-interest. And, you know, I think it's crazy how many people are coming in here sort of soft and saying, oh, well, it's all good. It's like, no, it's a smoking pile, man. It's this thing is, this is crazy. It is absolutely a 12-story stake in the heart of West San Jose. And I guess in reference to my earlier comment, you know what flowers grow really well in, and that is horse shit. And that's what we're being sold here, a pile of... Back to council. Well, on that note, uh, thanks, uh, everyone. Appreciate hearing the... Uh, the overwhelmingly uh, uh, constructive uh, comments from, from the community. Um, and I appreciate that there are some very uh, strong feelings, uh, particularly from neighbors who are concerned about all the impacts, traffic, parking, uh, and all the other issues that are related to a project of this density. Um, I, I do think it is um, an important testament to our community that people have stayed engaged and that in, been speaking out at many of these meetings and obviously today as well. So I wanna assure you that um, you're being heard. Um, I also appreciate there are many questions. I'll have a few myself. Why don't we go first so to uh, council member, I'm sorry, to Vice Mayor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to first of all thank the, the community that came out and spoke tonight. Uh, as everyone knows, we've had pretty extensive conversations with uh, community members. And um, what makes this project especially difficult for me is uh, these are a lot of the members who spoke and have talked to and have engaged with are not just my residents, my constituents, but they're also a lot of them are my friends. We have personal relationships. So uh, to be in a situation where, uh, where you have those deep relationships, the people that I'm going to be friends with for a long, long time, it makes this uh, especially difficult when they're in opposition of a project like this. It's been about a three-year uh, journey uh, when, I, when the project was first proposed to me and Sand Hill came to me. One of the first things that I said is I have to have affordable housing on site. Otherwise, this project is a non-starter for me. And so um, they accepted that very quickly and incorporated that into the plan at the very beginning. So I, I appreciate that. I also appreciate uh, the Sand Hill team uh, to working with me and working with uh, 
my staff working with Cassidy and taking in all the input that we gave you in terms of our vision of the project. And that vision is a project where all the members of the community and even throughout the area could come, can gather, can spend time, can eat, drink, can socialize in, in a development that's warm, that's friendly, that's inviting. And I believe that Sand Hill actually did capture the essence of what we were trying to do. They also were accommodating in terms of a strong setback from the neighborhood. Uh, they went with a residential focus as opposed to the school that was originally proposed. Uh, the community did want a grocery store. I heard people complain about how they missed Lucky's. And um, I can tell you that you know, when I used to shop at Lucky's, you could throw a, a rock and not hit anybody because there was very few people that actually were in Lucky's when we were shopping. But the demand and the attractiveness of a Whole Foods, I think, is a different scenario. And Sand Hill was able to, to do that. Um, just the vision of having a Main Street. Again, an area where you could walk from your house or ride your bike and spend time there and walk along that Main Street and go to an ice cream shop or a deli or just sit down and just talk with your friends. I mean, that, that's the vision. And I think that Sand Hill has captured that. Um, there are elements of the architecture that are outstanding. Uh, they actually won an award for um, their project. And um, it's going to be visually a very good project. And that's based on not just the input from my office, but also the input from the community. I have concerns about the height and density and the impact on traffic. So I'm going to um, speak to the traffic first. Uh, with my experience on Stevens Creek and our urban villages, as well as my position on VTA, I have a, a very good understanding in terms of the whole chicken and egg dilemma. Which came first, the housing or the transportation? And I can tell you, based on my efforts so far on Stevens Creek, it's the housing that comes first. We couldn't get VTA to have a, a lot of interest in terms of what we were trying to do on Stevens Creek Boulevard in terms of high-speed uh, transit, or just transit in general, until we develop our urban village plan. Once we made a commitment to build housing on that corridor, is when we got the interest of ETA to be able to provide resources to come up with a transportation plan. That's going to be the same scenario for this project. We have to go lead with housing first in order to get that transportation that everyone is looking for. Again, this is my experience. I've seen it firsthand, chicken and the egg, chicken or the egg, and it's the housing that comes first. Um, I really struggled with the, um, the issue around the height, especially, and the community, particularly people like Amy Cody and some of the other leaders, Rosemary Kamei, followed my advice. They did a lot of the things I asked them to do. They approached us the way I, I advised them to do, and they did all the right things. More than West, Baker West, and other, the other neighborhood associations, you did all the right things. Even the testimony tonight, you did all the right things. So how can I show you that we're listening to you? So what I did was I floated a proposal to reduce the height from 12 stories to nine stories. And I socialized that proposal with my Brown Act just to see if there was any interest or traction that I can get, at least for people to consider it. And I know that went, that proposal, we, which we socialized with the community, we socialized it with Sand Hill, and I'm sure, you know, Allison and Leslie and, and the team, you're, I'm sure your heads exploded when you saw it. But it was something I felt compelled to do because, again, the community did all the right things. And I wanted to show that I was listening 
I understand your concern. My, I got a lukewarm reception with, with that proposal and with other um, memos that came out, I had a clear understanding of where this was going in terms of counting votes. So I had to make a decision whether I wanted to just oppose the project or, or drop another memo with another alternative, knowing that it's not gonna go, go anywhere. I might get a couple of attaboys from the community saying, hey, Chappie, you know, you, stu you stood up for us and you opposed the project and, you know, get a pat on the back. But that's not something I could do and, and feel good about myself and look in the mirror. I wanna be very transparent with the community and very authentic. And, and my feeling is if I don't support the project, knowing the direction this is going, that I won't have an opportunity in my last six months to have the kind of input and impact on this project to at least incorporate other elements that are gonna benefit the community. So I'm not gonna make a motion right now, um, Mayor, but I wanna listen to the conversation from my colleagues so that you can hear directly from them the rationale behind this project and whether they support it or not. So I'll, I'll defer uh, to my colleagues, Mayor, and then if we can come back to me, that'd be- perfect. Okay, yeah, we'll come back to you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I had a couple questions and I'm happy to offer my, my thoughts. Um, one, I, I saw that one of the members of the community came forward with what appeared to be a planning department notice that described, uh, according to him, a project that was only 800 units and had a five acre park. Obviously that's not what this project is before us. So I wanna kinda understand, did we put out a notice suggesting this was going to have fewer units of housing and a bigger park than it currently has? This is early in the testimony. It was one of the gentlemen, uh, he's raising his hand now, yeah. I'm sorry, forgive me, I, I, I didn't write down your name, my apologies. Thank you, Mr. Abraham. Are, are you familiar, Robert? Yeah, oh, there it is. Okay, so that, there's a photograph, and perhaps, Tony, if you wouldn't mind just showing that to the planning staff, that'd be great. Uh, Robert, I'm sorry, your, your mic's not on right now. Okay. Yeah, it's not unusual for a project description to change during the uh, review process. The applicant will be able to specifically answer that question why it changed. But we did look at, especially from this uh, EIR standpoint, we looked at the maximum, which is uh, within the current proposal right now, and uh, the impacts wouldn't have still changed. And I don't believe there were... Uh, heights in that proposal that were higher. So uh, the applicant may be able to respond okay. directly to why it changed. Okay, would someone like to respond? And uh, the sign was not up Sir, there. Sir, I, I asked for the applicant, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, he, the question was about how, how the application changed. I, I, your point's well taken, I, I just want to understand the applicant's why. I think that the primary concern, I assume, is around the fact that a five-acre park is no longer. Uh, it's much smaller. Thank you for the opportunity. So as um, staff indicated, project description does change. Our studies did indicate there's multiple options um, that were being studied as part of the analysis. And I think all of that information was widely posted, um, both on city website as well as our own project website. So I don't take care of the um, the distribution of the mailing, but um, that information has well, been. Well, maybe between, can we just figure out who's responsible for the content of what is presented to the public? I, I think that's important to, to determine here. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor David Keon, uh, Principal Planners of the City's Environmental Review Team. So there was, a change in the project description from the very beginning of the project application. So, however, for the EIR, the notice of preparation, when that was issued, that was the description at that time, it was more conservative. So there were changes, and I think what the sign that was posted on the site was actually a sign, 
one of the first proposals, and that has subsequently changed. The notices that were sent out for this meeting and the EIR reflect the actual project, project actual project description. Okay. So, so David, is what you're telling me that regardless of what got posted initially, we have since sent out public notices that describe what we're looking at today, which is closer to a thousand units. And I can't remember, it's slightly more than an acre park. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Okay. I guess my concern is, I assume what he took a photo of was a sign was that was out there on the site. And do we have a process here for making sure that we're getting accurate information out on the site itself? Because that's obviously what's most visible to neighbors. There, John, to San Jose planning. There's a balance between trying to get early notice to the residents to be aware of a project that gets out there and posting a visual as soon as we possibly can. But we do reference contacting the project manager. We update the website as well as update the notice as the project does evolve. Um, so it is kind of hard to try to keep that notice changed during every iteration. Um, but we want to make sure that the notices and the community meetings are updated information as they come along. Okay. In terms of all the community, I know there have been several community meetings about this, <laughs> many. Um, in terms of what the city is presenting, presumably the developer as well, we have not presented that picture that is five acre park and 800 units in any recent meeting, I hope. <laughs> that, we that's fair to say. Okay. All right. Um, there was a question about the 1.7 acres that are de dedicated to Paseo. And I think one of the members of the community who's raising her hand now indicated that what we have designated as Paseo in fact has parking spaces, uh, which would suggest it's not a Paseo, it's really access for vehicles. Could, could we explain the discrepancy? Uh, Mayor, so John to San Jose Division Manager. So what they're describing is a paseo in the terms of kind of how it how it's activated and other aspect. There is a confusion of like what the city will actually accept as parkland versus what they call it as paseo. So we can call it a paseo. It's activated. We have chairs. We have other things that happen in a paseo. So overall, that's just an aspect of the project that can be activated. However, for the sake of the actual just area we wouldn't necessarily consider parking spaces as activated for sale but there are other aspects that do not have the vehicles parked near it that we would say is a more activated for sale okay I, I just would assume i would assume that in fulfillment of whatever parkland dedication requirements the developer has we would never count square footage that was essentially a driveway <laughs> That, that is correct, Mayor, but uh, Nicole Bernham, the Deputy Director for PRNS, is actually online and she'll okay. be able to uh, explain the Nicole. conversation Th going on. Thank you, Robert. Nicole, can you help? Sure. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Robert. Um, and thank you, John. Actually, John, too, gave a, gave a good summary. Um, I think all of the open space that's proposed as part of this project, it um, has not fully been vetted yet by PRNS. It's unclear whether it meets our requirements for parkland dedication. So what that means is it's unclear whether or not we will accept it as public park. That doesn't mean it doesn't have benefit for public space and public life. And there are opportunities to get credit for parkland dedication for privately owned spaces that contribute um, to recreation. So as the develop, if it's a, if this development's approved, as it moves forward, we would have to work with the developer to understand and detail out working with John and Robert's team, you know, what the proposed uses of the space are exactly, what is proposed where and how those spaces are gonna be used, um, what might be used for private dining or private um, cafe space um, to identify what actually would be eligible for park credit. Okay, thanks Nicole. So certainly I know we all assume if it's a patch of 
of grass and you can kick a ball on it, it's probably a park. <laughs> is it fair for, for me to assume as I'm sitting here, I understand you haven't worked out all the credits yet with the developer, but if it's got a parking space <laughs> or a series of parking spaces that, that, that line each side of it, which seemed to be the description that I was presented with, that would not be something that would be eligible to satisfy the PDO requirements of the developer. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes, I got off track with my answer. You are correct. Parking spaces would not be provided credit under the parkland dedication. Or, or for that matter, for that matter, the space in between the parking spaces that a car would need to drive to get to that parking. That correct. Would be, okay. You are correct. Absolutely. I just want to make sure that that whatever was characterized is not something that we're going to deem to be satisfactory for the obligations of the developer. You are correct. Okay. I appreciate the community member raising um, that issue as well. Uh, there were many important issues that were raised. It is a, obviously a very well informed community. Um, I, I uh, actually grew up a couple miles away from this site uh, back when was the El Paseo de Saratoga rather than the El parking lot, which it seems to be, which is that enormous massive parking area between what was the Lucky's and some of the other stores. Um, and I remember that prior iteration because it was actually a pretty uh, wonderful space. You could walk through it and there were, there were lots of uh, small restaurants and retail and I remember a toy store being in there. That's, that's something you remember as a kid. Um, and it was it was wonderful because as a parent, you could allow your kids to run around and not worry about what cars may or may not be coming. Uh, obviously, that was a prior iteration before we got to the current iteration of El Paseo. Um, and obviously, our conception of uh, what is an inviting commercial space changes with time. And I'd like to believe uh, this is a step forward. I do believe this is a step forward from what is there today. Uh, and I say that for a few reasons, and, and part of it really goes back to sort of our whole concept around urban villages. You know, we, we crafted a general plan back in 2011 with this concept of urban villages in our city, and we reached out and had more than 4,000 residents participate in that process about what we were going to create, what was going to be the vision for our city. And overwhelmingly, what we heard was that for the most part, the suburban sprawl that characterized our city for more than half a century was largely a failure. It was a failure in a whole lot of ways. It was a failure in terms of not providing certainly affordable housing that we critically need because single but family homes, and look, I grew up in a single family home and live in one now. I'm not disparaging them in any way, but that's not a recipe of success uh, if uh, ultimately you need to make room uh, create affordability in a large city. Uh, but it, it's, it was a failure for many other reasons. It, it leaves a lot of people trapped in their cars for far too long to get from one location to another. Uh, what overwhelmingly our community said they wanted was walkable communities where you have retail, restaurants, job opportunities, uh, and social amenities within walking distance of where you live. And, and that increasingly there's a sense that in the suburbia that we had created, and we're certainly not unique, this is all true in large cities all throughout the Western United States, there's somewhat of an isolating nature to the suburban communities we created. People are trapped in their homes. They occasionally escape when they get in a car and drive somewhere to park in a parking lot somewhere and walk into a store uh, for a brief experience with humanity, and then they return back to their homes. And it's, um, it is uh, something that I, I think an awful lot of folks expressed in various ways way back in 2011 as we were creating the Urban Village Plan was, was something that they believe we have an opportunity to reimagine, that we could create vibrant urban spaces because, you know, the, the vision that so many community members shared was that the great cities they love are not places they remember chained to their cars traveling 45 miles an hour down an expressway. Um, being chained to your steering wheel does not allow you to get outside and to be able to enjoy a park, a paseo, a plaza, or anything else. And, and in order to get those amenities, the parks, the paseos, the plazas, you need density and you need a mix of uses and you need all those things within 
walking distance. So that was the sort of source of the vision for urban villages. And so we created this plan in 2011 with an extraordinary amount of input from our communities about where urban villages would go. And the notion was we we're going to be densifying in, along, in many areas of our city that hadn't seen density like that before. And certainly as we look at this site at the intersection here, Lawrence Expressway and Saratoga Avenue and Quito, uh, we know that at least certainly Saratoga and Lawrence Expressway are major roads. Uh, and precisely those locations, that kind of intersection is, is what we had in mind. And we've had several updates now to the general plan, and we continue to hear support for that basic concept. And I know, I think a lot of neighbors will be understandably you know, frustrated uh, by the notion that so many San Joseans who weighed in today in their public comment don't necessarily live in the neighborhood. Those who support the project, well, they live somewhere else. So how could they, you know, it's not their traffic problem to deal with, it's mine. And that's an understandable reaction. But the reality is there's a lot of San Joseans in this city who are frustrated that lots of other parts of the city aren't really bearing their responsibility or, their, or, or, or sharing in the responsibility for providing housing for everybody and providing the kinds of urban villages that would make, I think, cities distinctive. Um, so we do have these urban villages, and yes, they're tall, and they're tall in lots of other parts of the cities as well. I think it was mentioned by the applicant during your presentation, Stevens Creek, Saratoga, Winchester, Stevens Creek. Those are just a couple locations of West San Jose, certainly. I live east of downtown, and I can <laughs> tell you about plenty uh, greater uh, uh, sites that are of greater density near where I live. Uh, and, and the point is that we put this plan together to give everybody a very clear idea of what could be built and what couldn't be built. So that everybody have clear expectations. Developers would know what they could build community members would know what they could expect. So we set the rules well in advance. And we tell the builders, comply with the plan and you'll get approved. If you don't comply with the plan, then we got no basis for, for, for saying yes. And so the idea is to try to get all that community input on the front end when you create the rules, not on the back end when somebody follows the rules. And then you kind of have to, well, a lot of folks don't like it, so I guess we'll, will readjust. I think, you know, fundamentally, we've got a builder who's not just willing to comply with the rules, I think in many ways, willing to go well above and beyond what we've seen many, many other builders do. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of great aspects of this project, not to mention the design itself, which I believe is very attractive. So I've reviewed uh, the depictions and the opportunity to bring a whole food store uh, to this corner of our city, uh, as well as obviously the 150 units of, of on-site affordable housing. So I think those are really important aspects of the project, uh, as well as others. Uh, and I think it's important for us as a community to say, we're going to set the rules and we're gonna, if everyone abides by the rules, they will be able to build. When we change the rules at the last minute, you get a pretty predictable response from the building community, which is San Jose isn't the place to invest any money because they'll set the rules. And when you've invested a million and a half dollars in all the planning and all the processes and all the architects and all the engineers, in this case, probably more than that, uh, you're gonna get a no at the end of the day, even after you follow the rules. And as you can imagine pretty quickly, you'll stop being a city where anybody wants to build anything anymore. And unfortunately, it's become a little too common in California. And as a result, we have a housing crisis. I, I do want to speak to one issue that I think Vice Mayor Jones raised, which you know I, I did appreciate. He, he did share with us proposals that I think would you know many in the neighborhood would have been much more uh, supportive of. And I was one of those folks who said, I don't think I, I can support this. And it was really because of what I just said. They're like, look, we set the rules. We reached out to the community. We had thousands of San Joseans tell us what they want with the rules. We've been very transparent about what is in this general plan. This is the blueprint for development of our city. If we think the general plan's wrong, then we should change the general plan. But we don't pull the rug out from under people because they followed the rules and some neighbors don't like it after the fact. The neighbors 
should be participating in the program and hopefully we're doing what we can to engage people uh, so they can participate meaningfully in the crafting of the general plan so we'll get the rules right and so i, I didn't support uh, that memo and you know the reality is it's not the case san jose is simply a mini mayor system i know that was the criticism in past years we just had a vote a couple items before where we had two council members in whose districts we were actually planning a housing for, for homeless residents who both voted against the particular proposal for, for various reasons. I'm not disparaging the reasons at all. And everybody else voted for it. But it was an example of the fact that there is not a mini mayor system in this city. Uh, we look at the needs of the entire city and decide what's best for the entire city. And it is true that there are parts of our city undoubtedly where density is not always as embraced, even though as we see here, we have a major intersection where density would be appropriate. So I support the project. Um, I know this is a very difficult decision for Vice Mayor Jones. I appreciate his honesty and his willingness to work extensively with the community. I think he's, you know, I've, I've just heard bits and pieces of the extensive amount of community meetings that have happened. Appreciate all staff's work here. Uh, this stuff is hard, but I think at the end of the day, we look back five years from now, people are gonna look at this in the same way I'm guessing. An awful lot of folks look at Santana Row. I know that uh, a lot of residents say, we don't want Santana Row, but when you start to realize, hey, it's pretty nice having a Whole Foods nearby and having all those great amenities and having a beautiful plaza and uh, something that's really attractive like this, uh, I think pretty soon people get around to the view that, hey, it's not bad having a world-class city here in our own neighborhood. And this is hard to bring a world-class city, this corner of our city. All right, uh, I see I, I, Vice Mayor Jones and I see Council Member Cohen. Did you want me to put it? Okay, Council Member Cohen. Okay, um, well, first I, I wanna thank um, all the members of the community that spoke up and uh, acknowledge the challenge that these kinds of situations are for any council member whose district uh, this, these things are in. Um, Vice Mayor Jones works really hard to try to make sure that the community is engaged and has their input heard. And I don't think there's anybody on council who, who does that more than the Vice Mayor. Um, and we've seen that on several projects that we've talked about in the last couple years uh, since I've been on council. Um, so I want to thank him for that. And similarly to the mayor, I, I had the opportunity to speak to the Vice Mayor over the weekend and get his input and, and hear his thoughts and, and weigh the various considerations on the project. Um, what makes all these things so challenging, and they're not unique to District 1, they're happening in various districts around the city, similar to what the mayor just said, but say in a little different way, the growing pains of going from what was our traditional type of bedroom community to a big city are, are very difficult for the people who are on the on the boundaries of where that's happening. Um, and we're trying to densify, we're trying to do what, what public planning tells us is the best way to, um, you know, what public planning theory tells us is the best way to build out a city um, while also trying to work hard to, to mitigate the effects on the residents in the area and also provide community benefit. Um, and I know there's been the work on setbacks and things to try to, to mitigate what, how the neighbors see the project. But I also think that we're learning a lot from some mistakes of the past in terms of how we've developed projects in the city. Um, and I, when I think about a project, there's several questions I ask. And I think when I spoke to representatives of this project, I, you'll, they'll, they'll recognize some of the questions I ask um, about, are we building affordable housing on site, for example? I'm very frustrated that you know, be, before my time on council, but years ago when North San Jose was built, started big, being built, 8,000 housing units were built there and not a single affordable, maybe one project of affordable housing was built, but really there's no affordable housing in North San Jose yet. I'm working really hard to catch up, and I think we will get to the point at which 20% of the housing in the north part of my district is affordable. But it's really important to me that projects include that affordable housing. And figuring out how to change a project without putting in jeopardy the inclusionary affordable housing 
is a challenge that we have to um, meet. So I was like, I am happy that that's in the project. And uh, you know, I heard some questions about, is there really an obligation? I've heard an obligation, I've heard a commitment from the developer for that affordable housing. And that's important to me that that commitment is met um, and the trust of that developer has to be maintained um, by us. Um, you know, we have a car centric city and we're trying to figure out how to dig ourselves out from that. Um, so I am appreciative of somewhere amongst during this most recent discussion of this project, the memo that, that I did sign on to includes a, a requirement of VTA passes to people who will live in the project for some period of time. I think we were trying to encourage uh, a, a new way of getting around San Jose and in the fall we'll be hearing about our move San Jose plans um, that the Department of Transportation is putting together to help people um, rethink how we get around. We won't necessarily have what 2.4 cars per household, but we'll have other ways of getting people around in the city. And I'm hopeful that once we add better bike infrastructure, better public transit infrastructure, that that will uh, work. Um, the other thing is that unfortunately, and I, I've been talking about this for years, you look around the city and, and the roofs of our buildings are useless, right? We have, a, we have a sunny big city and we have a lot of flat roofs with nothing on them. So I ask every developer, what are you putting on the roof of your building? Um, and this one, I think I can, maybe I can ask for clarification, for, for confirmation from our planning department, but I believe there's some green roof infrastructure and also uh, solar ready infrastructure on the roofs of this project. Is that is that true? Somebody wanna? Confirm that that's true. Yes, that's true. So, so it's um, it's uh, important, I think, to me that we get those kind of benefits for the community as well. And then the last mistake that we've made is we've built a lot of housing without mixed use. We've built a lot of housing that stands alone, where people don't have a place to go shopping, where people don't have a place nearby, and it's frustrating to be again representing North San Jose, where all these new residents are coming in, but th there's no there's no stores, there's no amenities, and this project provides that kind of mixed use that we're looking for. The trade-off here is that when we do these kinds of new type signature projects that have these, all of these benefits, there's going to be a, more height than we expect, and we're going to have to figure out how to coexist with that. And I think that that's what the, what the neighborhood is obviously concerned about. But I did want to express what I think are the good aspects of this project um, that I think can be a model for how we build good projects in the city going forward and how we rethink our communities. So um, while, I, while I definitely feel the, for the neighbors who are, who are concerned about what they might be seeing and what they're not, you know, what the unknown is bringing, I feel for Council Member Jones who's trying to, Vice Mayor Jones who's trying to, you know, balance that input from the community with making sure that he has a good project in his district. I, I think this could be a win-win for everybody once we move forward with the project. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Mayhan. Thanks, Mayor. I um, want to thank staff for overseeing the process here and Sand Hill for bringing forward the project and to the carpenters who all came out and do great work here in our region and, um, and especially the neighbors who have followed this process for three years or so and engaged very deeply along the way and, and are very well informed as the mayor mentioned. I've had the privilege of getting to know many of them over the past year and really appreciate their thoughtful feedback and, uh, and concerns. I'm not in the vice mayor's Brown Act, so we haven't had the opportunity to speak about uh, many of the issues, although I'm sure we spoke with many of the same residents. I, I did submit a memo regarding many of the concerns raised by the uh, residents in the neighborhood from parking, um, I'm sorry, traffic, parks. And to me, most importantly, the process by which we get here. And I wanna, I wanna first just acknowledge, I think there is a lot to like about this specific project. Um, it does, as my colleagues have already mentioned, it has many attributes that we wanna see in development in San Jose. It's mixed use with a new grocery store. I think we'd love to have a Whole Foods in downtown. Uh, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's mixed income with the affordable units on site. As many of us have referenced, that's a huge win. Thank you for including that. 
Um, it provides good high paying jobs, as has been mentioned, There's parking underground, there are improvements to the roadway and on and on. And, and I really appreciate that Sand Hill wants to invest in housing and jobs in San Jose. I, I think that's a good thing. And I think the mayor makes a good point about the general plan process and the vision that we laid out a decade ago for urban villages. Um, what I am concerned about and pointed to in my memo, which I hope is constructive moving forward, is what happens with the rest of this urban village. And, and I think, you know, this is about 10 acres out of 30 in one shopping center, out of about 174 in an urban village where the community, despite having participated in the general plan process, frankly, doesn't have a lot of clarity or at this point faith that those of us in public policy world over here are gonna get them the park space that they need <laughs> or deal with the fact that we're talking about what frankly is gonna be thousands of additional cars on the road over time as the site builds out. And so, you know, what I, had, I referenced a memo that I brought forward in December, and, and this is a specific example of this, is I think it really points to the need to adequately staff the proactive forward-looking planning in our planning and building department to get greater clarity around how we envision these sites building out as we attract investment. And to the point that the vice mayor made, I think having greater clarity is good for the community, for the investors, but also lets us more effectively coordinate with partner agencies like VTA, to hold them accountable for actually planning and communicating to the community how we're gonna handle this growth over time. I mean, many of the community members have raised with me the very real concern that we don't have a mass transit system locally that's very high performing, frankly. And I understand the chicken and egg argument. Well, we need more density to get transit to work. So fine, let's plan for the density and be clear about our vision for where we're going to have parks and how we're going to mitigate uh, th this growth. But that plan really isn't specific enough here. And, and I don't think it is in many of our urban villages. We've got, what is it, 68 urban villages? And I think we've planned about a dozen of them. And so I just, you know, my perspective on this is, is that the project has a lot of great attributes. It is the kind of development we want to see in San Jose, but the community deserves from those of us in government greater clarity around how we're going to address these issues that are consistently getting worse and eroding quality of life and for which we and many of our partner agencies, frankly, have not done enough. So access to parks, traffic, parking, many of the issues we've been talking about in recent months. So my, uh, you know, whoever makes the motion, I hope will incorporate my memo, which requests that the administration come back to whether it's CD or a more appropriate um, body here, but um, with a plan for funding the planning process around the entire urban village in El Paseo with extensive community input going forward so that we can really help the community understand how we're doing our part to plan for these impacts, as we know there's gonna be a lot more investment in this part of town. This is exactly the kind of urban village where there is market demand, which is great in some ways, but pretty hard for the folks who already live there. So I just wanted to lay that out as I know we are moving toward a motion here, and I'm fairly certain there's a project moving forward here, but I, I wanna think about what are we doing for the whole 174 acres here and what we know is gonna be really significant impacts on the folks who live here already and the new people who are gonna be accommodated in this great mixed use project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a couple questions. Uh, one, first off, I wanna say thank you, Lionel. There's a lot of people that participated tonight and, and obviously it's, it's, a, it's a very significant project. Um, and so uh, it's certainly controversial um, in, in nature, and I think anytime we have some of these larger projects, um, we, we get uh, some of the, the feedback as we've heard tonight on both sides, uh, because there is a significant need for projects like this, for new housing, affordable housing, dense projects, uh, completing our urban village plans. And there's a significant impact when these projects get built. And I think there's a lot of concern um, that, that comes along with it. But I, I do want to clarify a couple of things. I know the mayor um, spoke to this, but just to our planning staff, um, can you confirm, because we, we had the numerous allegations that this is not conforming 
to um, our our urban village plan here and, and what we have designated could and, and should be built. So does this project um, actually conform and, and, and meet the, 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 the stated goals? Councilor Parado, is the, this Robert Manford, the director for planning? Yes, it does. The project has been actually reviewed for conformance with all applicable land use regulations, including the general plan and the urban village plan, and it's in conformance uh, so with safe the signature to say, Robert, project if, criteria. Yeah, thank you. It's safe to say, Robert, if, because if, we heard a lot of people that, that, that made claims that that was not the case tonight, um, members of the community, it, I'm, I'm assuming here that they have a different understanding of, or they're reading um, into differently uh, how the, the plan and, and what would stipulate a signature project. Um, but from from our planning team and professionals, the the, the understanding is that this is fully conformant, correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I would agree with the mayor as well in regards to sort of pulling the rug out from our development community. We uh, will not get any of our urban villages built if um, we simply change the, the rules uh, at, at this stage in a development project. Um, I, I respect what our vice mayor did here uh, and, and the work that he's put in. Uh, and, and that's something that we as elected officials do working with our community and working with developers to try and find projects that can straddle uh, what is needed and, and what uh, is, is willing to be accepted by the community. And as the vice mayor pointed out, um, he did attempt to try and see if he could accommodate a little bit less height. Uh, that is something that I, I did not agree with. Um, I, I did not feel that reducing the height um, was, was going to be beneficial to the overall project, to the, the need that we have for housing uh, in, in the area, and, and specifically to, again, what is allowed in this urban village, um, and specifically with this signature project. Um, and I do believe that, that you know, the developer as well um, was, uh, you know, accommodating throughout the process and now uh, was not interested in, in, in a reduction in height again. Um, and, and I would concur with that. I, I do want to point out as well, um, I think in contrast to what Councilmember Mahan just said on the, the planning out of, of urban villages, uh, we've had a number of urban villages plans completed in, in District 3. I appreciate that we have decided to do away with the phasing that we had um, in allowing projects like this to be able to move forward. But I wanna make clear that, and, and specifically again, from the projects that we, the, the villages that we've completed the planning process on in, in my district, we don't specify exactly where parks are going exactly where office is going, exactly where housing is going. Uh, we put out a blueprint of what is allowed. Um, what we obviously we, we design what we'd like to see. We have some height maximums and um, types of development. And we, we have designed the footprint of where these urban villages will lie and, and then discuss the boundaries and the setbacks. But we don't specifically state this is where a park will go. Uh, the city doesn't own the majority of the property in urban villages. Um, so we don't get that level of, of specificity or direction in projects. And uh, quite frankly, most projects in urban villages are going to be piecemeal. It, it was uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity to get a project, for instance, like the, the Google Village project where you have a company or, or a developer as significant as, as Google to be able to come in and help master plan a, a large landmass like they did. That is extremely rare. And, um, and we weren't, we're not gonna see that. We, we, don't, we haven't seen that in my urban villages in district three, it's, it's been piecemeal. And that's why we, we set up this blueprint of an urban village and, and we do our best to, to, to attempt to get projects that will conform to that. Uh, and in this case, that's exactly what is transpiring. We have um, you know, a, a, an urban village that uh, unfortunately is not completed. So we have our signature project 
uh, opportunity that, that we've also approved a number of those in, in within district three and um, this project is fully conforming and I'm not against completing the, the urban village in the area I think that um, right it would be great if we could complete the urban villages throughout the entire city um, but that's a significant body of work and I just wanted to ask staff about that as well um, if we were to include Councilman Mahan's memo uh, is that is that changing your workload is there is there something you know where that was already at in in line um, or is that something that staff is comfortable with what what is the uh, response from staff in regards to that that expediting that that work John to acting division manager um, I probably would have to speak for on behalf of my citywide team it takes on average anywhere from two years to three years to develop an urban village plan with the outreach getting all the phasing components and getting the implementation of aspects all worked out as well as doing extensive outreach. So it'd be pretty tough um, given the staff levels as well as having to secure the funding to do those uh, studies. And as you correctly stated in the process, we do allow developers to move forward with the signature project with you know a pretty extensive list of additional criteria uh, to let them proceed ahead of an urban village plan. Um, so in the question of you know developing and taking up all the capacity, the capacity assigned to each of our village is just the amount that is environmentally cleared. The council, as well as the additional environmental study, can increase the capacity of each individual village as well. Um, I think that's one of the other questions that the other council members had. And, and so where is this? Sorry, where is this this urban village um, plan at in sort of in the, the pipeline right now? And because uh, I, I understand the workload, right? It would take a significant amount of work. Um, where might it be in the in the in the pipeline? Councilmember yeah. Perales, this is Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager. Um, first, I, I just wanted to share with you that the citywide planning staff does report to the Community and Economic Development Committee um, at least annually on their work plan for urban village planning. Um, we're actually currently planned uh, in the draft work plan to go to CED. Um, with an update in February of next year. Um, obviously, if the council so desires that we report to CED earlier, we can certainly do that. Uh, and council member, I will say that currently um, in the citywide planning program, um, an urban village for uh, this area is currently not in our work plan. So it would be something that staff would have to take a look at in terms of prioritizing other planning efforts that they're looking in. Interestingly enough, just um, this morning at our CSA discussion, we were discussing two potential urban village plans, working with other city departments, talking about which would be the best one to move forward with. So I would suggest that we give the citywide planning team an opportunity to finish that analysis and then to bring a recommendation to the CED committee on the next um, couple of urban village plans that would get underway. And you don't need direction to do that, right? I mean, that's work you're already doing, correct? That is correct, council member. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to simply prioritize this urban village because of this one project um, and, and deem that this, you know, take priority over uh, the, the rest of the work that you're doing or take priority over allowing the the team uh, to come together and and help make a recommendation to the council i think that's the appropriate path to go um and and so i, I appreciate uh, the suggestion um but I, I i i will make a motion here and and uh, i'll make a motion to approve uh the, the staff recommendation recommendation um and with the joint memo uh, that I signed on to with uh, the vice mayor and my colleagues. Second. That's all for me, Mayor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Reynas. Thank you. So sorry, I'm having some technical issues. Um, thank you for your patience. I um, also want to start off by thanking uh, a lot of the residents that came out um, to share with us um, some of their concerns and some of their hopes. Um, 
it, um, excuse me. I guess the, the, the grass is always greener on the other side. And, and the reason I say that is because um, my district is not the district that typically receives a lot of investment. And, and um, I think we have one of uh, the higher um, household um, incomes, but yet uh, we can't keep a Constantino's open. Um, it eventually got uh, taken up by, well, it was two different stores and it eventually ended up being um, a, a small market, uh, Walmart market is what I call, what they call it. And so access to resources in my neighborhood um, is tough. And um, I know that this, this is, this project is adding resources to that neighborhood. And while I think that there, there is some benefit um, to the community, I can also understand the difficulty of seeing your community change around you. And so I, I, um, I definitely can appreciate that. I heard some of those concerns. Um, Mayor, I, I appreciate you asking some of those questions about uh, the notice and, and what uh, got posted because I also had those concerns and questions. And, um, and I'm glad that that got cleared up um, as well as uh, some of the meetings that uh, that were shared um, or the number of meetings or the discrepancy with the number of meetings. Um, so I'm glad to, to hear some of that uh, get clarified. I know it's going to be difficult to see the community around you changing. I remember when my dad was alive, he would say, this was all orchards here. Um, and this was orchards and we'd go to any, almost any part of San Jose and he would say, and this was, uh, you know, this was this kind of orchard or over in this area. Um, we always look back at what used to be, um, but I think this project is an opportunity to see what we can be. Um, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm supportive of this, of this project, not only, um, because it has affordable housing on site, which is something that it's very rare. We haven't really seen that in many of the projects, but also because it's going to bring resources to our communities. And when you bring resources, we know that people like to move into a, a, a nice and well-resourced neighborhood. It means that families have an opportunity, that children have an opportunity to go to, go to better schools, and um, that lays the path down for some children to be successful as they age and um, become adults. They just have different opportunities to educational uh, systems because simply because of where they live. And we are all trying to um, mitigate uh, that factor that it, and, and avoid having um, children's future predetermined by the place that you live. But unfortunately, that continues to be the reality. And so this is a high resourced area. It's a very nice area. And it's going to bring in, um, I think it's 199 affordable housing for, for families. That's a little less than half of what we approved earlier today. And earlier today, we, we heard four different um, projects. And all those, those pro the projects that we, um, we enabled um, to, to help uh, assemble some of that financing are going to serve our families throughout the city. But this, and, and throughout the city, and, and throughout the city, they'll, they'll have different levels of access. For example, in Alum Rock or on West San Carlos. 
this is definitely um, a very high, well-resourced area that we know is going to make a difference for families. It's one of the reasons why I'm supporting this. And uh, let me correct myself, it's 150 um, affordable units. I don't know why I had 199 in my head. Um, and so I, I do want to acknowledge that um, with this project, like I said, it's not often that we get to see it. This is why I'm supportive, but I'm also uh, uh, very respectful of where our vice mayor um, um, in his direction, I thought this was gonna go back to, uh, to you, vice mayor, in terms of emotion, um, because you have always demonstrated um, a very well balanced uh, perspective, and uh, you you're a, a wonderful listener of your community, and you know what works in your community. Um, and I trust the direction that you uh, would go in. Um, I know that there's a different motion on the floor than maybe you you had hoped. Um, uh, e either way, I, I think that um, what we're going to see in this part of San Jose is an opportunity um, for future families and for children to have those well-resourced opportunities that we've all been talking about. Um, and it's it doesn't have to come through the city. And we don't have to put money together and we don't have to you know, do all the work that, that the housing department does um, to get affordable housing out the door. Um, that's going to be all on the developer. And so one of the, um, one of the things that have, I have seen in other projects is that affordable housing gets left at the very end. And so I don't know if um, Eric is still on or, or um, somebody else who's representing the, the project um, because I want the assurance that affordable housing units will not um, be the last ones and get scratched uh, or X'd out of, of the plan simply because they're not um, feasible anymore. Okay. I'm not sure if you're able to see, but... Um... Representative for the applicant is uh, approaching that mic. And who is that? Uh, me? Allison Koo with Sand Hill. Oh, Allison, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Ms. I'm sorry. I apologize. I know that you presented at the beginning. I apologize. No problem. And thank you for your question. Um, as we mentioned, we're committed to bringing affordable housing on this project. Um, there are various phases that will take place on the project. Um, and so we anticipate that the first building is Whole Foods. But beyond that, I think that our goal is to finance the project in its entirety and finance the affordable component. So we are not trying to um, push it towards the end, but we are trying to work together on the entire project um, in a sequential process. Um, great, thank you, Allison. And, and this is a question I had posed um, previous to developing this memo and um, providing my support. Um, uh, and I posed the question to you, but I wanted to do it publicly because I did hear some comments earlier from some of our community members as to um, the plan in terms of where those affordable housing units would be, when those uh, affordable housing units would be developed. And so, I'm hearing an, a level of assurance from you um, that those will get developed, that there is no intention of delaying or uh, avoiding the development of these uh, affordable housing uh, units. I, I appreciate the commitment. Uh, thank you, Allison. Uh, by the way, thank you. I appreciate the commitment, so I will be um, uh, supporting the, the motion on the floor. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor, I think, yes, we've now run through all the council members. Okay. Thank you. A um, couple of, of quick questions. Um, 
I know the subject of the MTIP or multimodal transportation improvement plan came up. Can can is there anyone here that can speak to what that means for uh, Saratoga in that area? Thank you for the question, Vice Mayor Jones. Jay Guevara, Deputy Director of Public Works. I am, uh, pun intended, stepping out of my lane, uh, but it is related to the funding for the Urban Village Plan. So the, the MTIP does not have funding yet. However, Department of Transportation's plan lines were shared with the community uh, for that future state when funding does become available. That includes the plan lines and as the memo recommends of the project for the removal of the pork chop islands, improvement for pedestrian safety, uh, bike lanes, and uh, again, those were shared with the community at this point in time, given the funding status. Thank you. Um, on, the, on the subject of um, an urban village plan, I know that you spoke to it, but isn't there al already um, direction to pursue funding from MTC for both De Anza and Saratoga? Thank you, Vice Mayor. Rosalind Huey. Uh, yes, um, as I recall, uh, we did get direction from council uh, to advance both of those urban village plans. And I would have to confirm with staff, but we did pursue those uh, grant opportunities with MTC and just need to verify, in fact, that we got those. Okay. My understanding is we, we did not receive those, that funding. Okay. But if, if, if I'm wrong, that'd be actually positive news, but. I'll have to verify with staff. I've been away from it uh, for, for a while now, so I'll have to verify with the citywide planning team. I appreciate it. And, and really, uh, Council Member Mann, um, the reason why I asked that question is, you know, I've gone through uh, the urban village process. And I know in terms of the resources, funding, uh, that's pretty intense. They, they said it's a two year process. That's pretty accurate. That's two years once the process starts, not getting to the process. In our previous urban village, um, urban villages, we had MTC grant money to support, you know, we were able to bring in a consultant. So there's so many different elements that are involved with um, the process of, of starting an urban village. Uh, so I just wanted to give you that kind of a, an expectation that, you know, we're talking about four years out, you know, best case scenario. That's why in our, our memo, we uh, gave direction to have the developer, Sandhill, start a visioning process for the, the, the parcel that, that's currently um, under potential development. And uh, that's going to be potentially a, fa a much faster process as well as it's an opportunity for the community to be engaged with Sand Hill in terms of the vision for at least for that parcel, that for that thirty, the whole thirty acres. So I just wanted to just, uh, you know, bring that to your attention. And um, and then Councilmember Perales, um, you uh, you grabbed my uh, motion, but uh, you're gonna let me. You're gonna have to let me uh, make a motion for a, a downtown project sometime in the future. <laughs> but uh, can you um, can I make a friendly amendment to your motion? Uh, we we found out that there's some um, cost issues and implementation issues with the BTA passes. So um, we want to modify item three on the memo to say that we would do we'll do a review or evaluation after two years to address those 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 potential issues. If yes, I'm happy to. Uh, right. Yes, and I apologize if I stole your thunder. I'm I'm happy to, uh, to you know, uh, <laughs> set aside my motion if you'd like to. Once stolen, to the it. thunder okay. cannot be returned. Okay, <laughs> then I'll keep it and I'll accept your your friendly amendment. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And um, again, um, thank you to the community. Thank you to Ken, Leslie, Allison. Thank you to staff. I mean, this has been a it's been a three year journey. And uh, we're coming to the end. And uh, the expectation is this is going to be an amazing project. 
there's certain elements that people aren't happy about, but there's going to be elements that uh, the community is going to love. So let's move forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, spoke too soon when you said the end. Uh, uh, Councilmember Mayhem. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mayor. And I'll, I'll be quick and um, I, I will support the specific project, as I've said, but I, I do I do think it's a mistake to not push harder on planning the 174 acres. It, it absolutely will take four years, and I think that's fine. That's the kind of process we need to go through. The build out of this urban village will likely take 10 to 20 years. I think the value of comprehensively planning, and we've said this, we had this conversation last year when we looked at five wounds in Little Portugal, and we all talked about how great it was that we were going through a more comprehensive planning process because that helps other agencies like VTA think ahead about where we're growing and coordinate investments in transportation mobility solutions, which is what we're constantly asking of them. In fact, the feedback I received from staff because I didn't have the benefit of being in the, in the Vice Mayor's Brown Act group was that getting the urban village plan would actually be useful here and would help answer many of the questions the community has. And it's not that we're gonna have all the answers, we're gonna determine exactly where the parks are, but it would certainly give greater clarity to our partners at VTA with what, what could happen here. And importantly, it would get us out of this reactive incremental, here's a project. Now the community is shocked and concerned and doesn't understand how it fits into the whole. I just don't buy that the process we went through 11, 12 years ago for the general plan means that we've laid out the vision and the community should just get it. I, I think that's unrealistic. And I think having a, a thoughtful, detailed process around each of our urban villages, and I get that's expensive, we're not going to do it for all 68, but I believe the direction we gave last December said for urban villages with high market demand, with high potential for housing production, and we specifically talked about West San Jose, that the administration was directed to come back with a proposal for increasing staffing through the budget process, and shame on me for not raising this question during the budget process that we've just gone through, but specifically for increasing staffing investment around planning some of these urban villages. So I, I am surprised to hear that we won't be getting an update on that until February and that this specific urban village is not currently contemplated to be part of that list. I personally think that's a mistake. It's something we can talk about more offline, but Rosalind, I don't know if you can provide any more detail as to why this would not be on the list. Thank you, council member. And I, I wasn't suggesting that this particular urban village would not be on the list. I just think that the citywide planning team would want to just conduct an analysis um, of other urban villages that they are considering uh, given market strength, um, potential redevelopment sites. So it's something that we could we would factor in into that decision making. Okay, I misheard you. I thought you said that it was not currently on the list. You're saying it's still under consideration. Correct. What I meant to say is that we're not currently planning to undertake an urban village right now, but it's something that we would certainly take into consideration. Okay. And the next update would be February. Is that correct? It's currently scheduled on the draft work plan for February, yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I don't feel that we quite stuck with the direction that we had given last December. That's partly my fault for not following up on it. But um, I, I do think, in contrast to some of the other comments, I think there's a lot of value in planning these out with the community and having greater clarity around where we think we're going with these urban villages. I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you. I just want to follow up a bit on that. Um, I assume the reason why it didn't come up in the budget process is that uh, planning's got a lot of vacancies right now, and I assume filling those vacancies is probably uh, the necessary uh, precedent to being able to actually get to expanding planning staff to, to take on new urban villages. Is that fair, Robert? Or That or? is correct, Mayor. Okay. And, and Mayor, if I could add, staffing definitely is a challenge, but um, the budget did include uh, funding, I believe it was $400,000 to actually bring on a consultant or contract planner to assist in the development of the next phase of urban village plans. Okay, great. So, so Councilman Mahan didn't miss it. Uh, we actually do have some funding in there to, to begin. Um, 
so could you just give us a sense of what the queue looks like? I, I know that not all 60 some odd urban villages uh, are ready to roll. Uh, and um, clearly some like this one, um, Mount Sartic Avenue, are particularly strong, have particularly strong market interests. Uh, could you just give a sense of how many urban villages we think are likely in that, in that group that we're trying to assess where we start planning? Yeah, I know that initially we were looking to uh, identify about five different urban villages. Um, clearly, you know, the, the market demand we know is in West San Jose. Yeah. So we are definitely taking a look at those um, urban villages in that area for sure. Okay. That, that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, let's vote then on the motion from Councilmember Perales. It should have been the motion from Vice Mayor. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Thanks for rolling it in. <laughs> Aye. Frosto? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. That's it for today's agenda. We'll now uh, hear public comment on open forum on any item that's not on the agenda. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, that last item was one for the ages, I think. Uh, thank you. Uh, happy June to everyone. Um, boy, uh, um, I would like to talk more about this item tomorrow at open rules and open government and, uh, and in the future uh, CED meeting possibly. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, you offered interesting ideas. I wanted to, I guess, mention that the uh, uh, city of San Diego just worked through their uh, surveillance and technology ordinance ideas. Uh, interestingly, it's got some really good ideas that includes a uh, public accountability board. And the language of their ordinance really speaks to the concepts of just good civil protections and civil rights and uh, civil liberty ideas. I mean, it basically voices what I've been trying to say here to you guys for years now. It was interesting. I had an interesting time and interesting experience. And uh, I, we can share information between cities. It'll be interesting how that can take place in the, in the coming months and years. Uh, LA is working on issues. Um, good luck how we can share information. I'm interested in the idea that uh, for as much as you approve things like the alfresco planning, al alfresco dining, I hope we can continue uh, the Zoom process for meetings, uh, for public meetings. I think it offers uh, an interesting way to, to, to offer public opinion and ideas and, and the sharing of ideas. Uh, good luck how in this uh, post COVID era that we're trying to move into, that I think uh, things like Zoom can be a good possibility for ourselves into the future. Um, it's with all of that, uh, good luck how we can share information and ideas. And uh, that's the key, I think, at this time. I don't think we have to be excluded and exclusive to our own little islands anymore. Good luck how we share information and ideas. Thanks a lot. Clarice. Clarice. Bumagot. Hi, hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Clarice Bumagot, and I've been a resident from of San Jose for many years now. I was happy to hear of the plans and efforts underway to address homelessness and provide individuals with affordable and um, interim housing. And I really hope, um, as leaders of our community, that you continue to uh, prioritize finding um, viable solutions to address homelessness. Um, I live um, close to Reinhardt Drive, which is very close to um, Jackson, Ab um, Jackson Avenue, which has a homeless encampment. And um, many of my neighbors are frustrated and are also fearful because the presence of this encampment has presented many safety issues for people living in this neighborhood. 
Um, I am supportive of interim housing and regards to the challenges in gaining support for interim housing. I think it is important to um, continue to provide support for these individuals um, when, when they are housed, um, such as job assistance, mental health and substance abuse resources, because um, I don't think you will prevent the behaviors that make residents feel unsafe if these um, issues aren't uh, addressed firsthand. Um, thank you. Back to the council. Uh, thank you very much. Can I just ask the, the woman who just spoke if she's able to to just tell us again where the encampment was that was particularly challenging for their neighborhood? Sure, it's um it's on Reinhardt Drive. Okay, could you give it's, us a near cross street or um um Reinhardt and uh, Jackson? It's very close to Independent High School. Okay, gotcha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone, the, the meeting's adjourned.